cool. So, uh, hey, welcome. I mean, you've been here all week, but welcome to the ACC breakout for today. We normally, I had a chance to chat with a few of you at uh, dinner last night. I know we did some breakouts differently. It's kind of what happens in Air Combat Command based on size, right? You find a venue for about 100 of us. It was easier to bring in some of the numbered Air Force chiefs and kind of break us out. So I had a chance to talk with you during, during uh, dinner, a few of you. You know, normally we would do this on our own, right? Like Chief Wright had spoke to her earlier and, and we talked about it at the beginning of the week. So I'll look for your feedback. You know, we can chat about that this afternoon on, on what your thoughts are going forward. But I mean, I really think this has been good. You know, not to change your feedback, I'm saying, but I really think this is good to find the synergy. But I'll tell you the things that I felt that we lost out of it was the more interaction, the more personal attention that we could get with our chiefs, right? As the MAGCOM, and in the, in the past, we would bring in all seven of the ACC NAFs also. They weren't all available for this, so they would be here. Uh, and the interaction that they got with you also during the week, I thought was very good. But come one April, shoot, man, probably, I don't know, 20%, 25%, 30%, you aren't even going to be an air combat command, right? So to me, that was something more just a, we've done it historically this way, so you know, you have this feel, oh, I really need to know my chiefs. Uh, and we have in the past always been able to work that too and allow chiefs to go to the breakouts and made sense to where they're going to end up fighting anyway. So I've even made some accommodations this week for that. The other thing I think that uh, we we missed a little bit on, that you missed out on, not me. Uh, the chiefs group isn't giving me any more assignments. Uh, but we had time for one-on-one -on -one breakouts at the MAGCOM too, where it was a personal 10 to 15 minutes, sit down with your, with your assignment person. And we had spouses come in. That's another piece that we will we'll work on next year. Uh, and you and your spouse, uh, significant other, could sit down and have a discussion with the chief group. I know they accommodated many of you, uh, but it was difficult to get everybody through because at the same time, we don't want the entire chief group to be down here uh, having one-on-one -on -one chats with you, right, when they're also trying to process every assignment uh, right now and close out the assignments. But I welcome you to Air Combat Command's brief. It'll be a good day. We'll, uh, hopefully you're not seeing me as the in between you and leaving, this was a planned, scheduled part of the day. I know Chief Wright already gave his closing remarks. There was like, ooh, let's get out of here. Uh, and then you got to come in here and listen to us. I'm hoping it's productive. Uh, there's some briefs that we'll give throughout the day. I got Chief Dave Wade in here with me from the 9th Air Force. He'll brief you on the JTF and kind of where we're at with the 9th Air Force standing up to JTF, as well as the training that, that they do there to prepare our airmen to go forward and, and work in the JTF. I got Chief Dave Klink out of 24th Air Force. And he'll give us a cyber brief later in the afternoon. I believe we're going to the secret level for that. We don't have to. It's an unclassed. Okay, so it'll be unclassed, uh, which, you know, cyber unclassed isn't as cool as cyber when you get to get into all the other discussions. But uh, Dave will talk about that. And then uh, John Storms from the 12th Air Force and AF South. I forgot your one title, too. You're also AF Cyber, as well as the joint uh, cyber uh, uh, SEO there, too. So anyway, John Storms, 12th Air Force, AF South. He'll give us a brief on an update a little bit on the uh, Mountain Home organizational experiment. I know many of you have heard that across our command and where we're going and what the future of it is. Is it going to grow past uh, uh, Mountain Home? He'll, he'll talk more on the Mountain Home and the, the feedback he's getting there. And there's a little bit of a brief, and then I can talk more broadly on maybe the future of that, as well as uh, that's what that force optimization piece is, is talking about the future of Air Combat Command and what we're looking at with some of our numbered air forces and how we plan to change some things around to present forces in the way that we need to present forces. Uh, I know there'll be some discussion throughout this. These briefs aren't meant to be just clicking slides. I'm going to go through our, our uh, MAGICOM command brief. I, I tailored it a little bit. Uh, but I do want everybody to see, you know, our organization, see the structure and understand a little bit more about it. I know many of you have been in it for years. But I'll tell you, I was in the 23rd wing for two years, and I didn't realize all the things that were going on in the 25th Air Force. I didn't realize the things that the Warfare Center was doing. I mean, and then even at the 9th Air Force, I was pretty smart on the 9th Air Force and all those things that were the 9th Air Force. But outside of that, I wasn't as smart on So this is what this is intended to do, is maybe have a broader uh, uh, perspective on what's going on within the command, what's in our Air Force, and then to talk through whatever topics you want to talk through, right? It can be the briefs, it can be some of the uh, uh, speakers that have, or just, hey, uh, to Chief Wright's point, hey, I hear you guys talking about this, and, uh, and I'm willing to chat with you on any topics. One thing I want to uh, maybe impress upon you and put stomp, I don't know if you, you 
really recognize how transparent your leadership is in the Air Force right now. I mean, especially the AFSELC and the senior enlisted leadership and your chief officer in the Air Force. There is nothing that we're talking about. We've we've been, you know, there's many of the breakouts you didn't see the the MATCOM guys and gals in there because we were in there talking about some other uh, issues with regard to how we're going to uh, do some talent management and achieve, how we're doing some promotion, uh, uh, future promotion opportunities, and how we're going to go through these. But those are items, man. If we're in that room talking about it and the door's closed, it's just because we don't want you to hear us cussing each other out. When we come out and you say, hey, Chief, what were you in there talking about? I'll tell you exactly what we are talking about. I have no concerns that you're going to go put it on Facebook or you're going to go tell somebody because transparency builds what? It builds trust. If you know what I'm talking about, then you understand where we're going. You can understand a little bit of the background of the decision. The other thing it helps me with is you can say, gee, that's the damn stupidest idea I ever heard. I'm like, and I, I thought it was pretty smart. But here, let me understand why you think it's stupid. And then I can more inform my decision or my, my thought. Because uh, in my position, you know, that's what I do. I represent all of you. I represent the you know, close to 100,000 airmen across Air Combat Command. So anyway, I'll get started with these slides. We'll go through them and then stop me at any time if you have any questions. And then uh, we'll just have some discussion afterwards and then I'll be turning over to Chief Storms to give his brief and we'll just keep going through the day. Did I have that right? You're next. You're next. I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. That's why I have these guys here. So this is interesting, right? So I wear this patch on my, my arm over here. Someday we might figure out where the patches should be or not be. You know, there was a whole thing about that on MAGCOM patches, and we're still working through some of that. Uh, but people first, mission always. And, you know, you can go round and round and round about, you know, philosophically to discuss, hey, which is right. I think you got it right. You know, if you take care of the people, if you focus on the people first, and you do everything you can to do that piece right then what's going to happen the mission is going to happen because they're going to be motivated they're going to be well led and they're going to be you know having a common purpose to go and do these things but me and my boss aren't idiots right me and general holmes aren't idiots in the fact that our air force doesn't always work in that way and his comment to me many times is chief what if we did live in an air force that believed in that right and it actually you know that was what the focus was people first mission always but it is our motto <clears throat> you guys know these people Obviously, most of you know the major commands, right? <laughs> I forgot one yesterday. We were talking. We did. We were looking around the room, and I was like, "Man, no, everybody's here." And they're like, "Frank, there's there's ten of us." And I was like, "Oh, that's right. Is there ten up there? Eleven. Well, the guard. The guard's different. The guard is a. a we, they're on the app stuff, but they're not necessarily considered a magic code. There's me, General Holmes. This is our updated. So. I didn't know if everybody realized we have seven numbered Air Forces with Air Combat Command. Most recently added was the 24th Air Force. Uh, we'll talk more about force optimization, but this can change in the future on how many we're going to have and how the alignment's going to be. 35 wings, and those uh, expeditionary are the ones that we just finished filling, so it's, it's interesting. We have an administrative uh, oversight over the AFSEN personnel. But in reality, it was that those when we send our personnel forward into the 455th wing at Bagram, what they're cut to CENTCOM, right? And AFSEN is the air component of those. So those are not really our airmen, but those are our wings because administratively we have oversight over. Here's the Air It's just going to show you where all the wings are at. So Warfare Center, you know, responsible for our tests, responsible for our exercise, responsible for developing new uh, things within the command and tactics and techniques. The 505th does that on the command and control side. The 99th obviously runs the, the, the wing out at Nellis. You got the 57th wing uh, with our Thunderbirds as well as much of our, our uh, oh shoot, I just dropped the ball on the wings. The 53rd wing does our test, you know, it does all of the developmental tests. You know, you got, I get that back. They do all the OT. You got the DT and the OT, and 53rd does the DT. The EADS and WADS. So the first Air Force is an interesting uh, numbered Air Force underneath this. When I came into the job, I had a double check the board chart. But yes, the first Air Force is a part of Air Combat Command. <coughs> People think it's different because it's the Guard. Uh, Lieutenant General, General Williams, that runs it. It's the Guard. You know, Command Chief uh, Rich King is the Command Chief. And many people think it's a guard nap, and it falls underneath the guard, but it doesn't. It's our link into the, uh, the defense of this nation, right? And those, 
those attachments and those squatters across our United States that we have uh, sitting alert, that's what falls into the first Air Force. They also have the AOC down there that stands up as the JFAC for North and North Carolina. Uh, it does anything within Homeland uh, Security. The EADS and WADS are the Eastern and uh, Western Air Defense uh, sector. So that's what that's talking about. Ninth Air Force, you know, back in the day, the, the way we organized our Air Combat Command was really the Mississippi, right? Everything east of the Mississippi and the combat forces was 9th Air Force, everything west of the Mississippi really is the 12th Air Force. So it's kind of a very similar look between the 9th and 12th Air Force with most of our flying units as far as the fighter and then our personnel uh, res personal rescue. Uh, that, of course, is going to change too in the future. I, I got APJs in here. I think I already cleared one of them off. So, it, you know, it, that, that's a moving forward thing. General Goldfein is looking to push our uh, guardian angel back into AFSOC. It's kind of gone back and forth over the years, whether they've been in Air Combat Command or Guard, in, in AFSOC. The thing you can tell when you go back and forth over the many years is either we never quite got it right, or it really doesn't matter where they're at. So let's just find synergies, and we think we're going to get some better synergies inside of that. AFSEN, you guys are well aware of AFSEN. We added a wing last year. A lot of people don't understand the added wing, the 321st AEW at the top. That's in Iraq. And it basically does the same thing that the 438 AEW does. In Afghanistan, that's the train advised assist mission, but with the Iraqi Air Force versus the 438 Afghan Air Force. Talked about the 12th. The 12th also is dual hatted, like I mentioned there, also the AF South component. There'll be some discussion later on the force optimization of what we're looking to do with regard to the NAFs there. 24th has got our two cyber wings in it. Uh, one is kind of resembles, in my mind, like an OSS type of thing and handles like more of the network and all the that piece and then the side, the other side of it handles more of the operations and the defensive piece. But Chief Clink will get in that because he's a heck, heck of a lot smarter than the, uh, all things cyber. Just, it's interesting because, you know, that's the other thing I'll tell you about Chiefs. Uh, I'll, I'll jump around a little bit. I apologize if that happens there. But uh, we talked last night about Chiefs. I think the greatest thing about being a Chief Mass Sergeant in Air Force or being an enlisted member, let's just say an enlisted member in our Air Force, is there is absolutely no functional ceiling for you. None whatsoever. The only thing standing in your way to do whatever it is you want to do on our Air Force on the enlisted side is really you, right? On the officer side, you can't say the same thing, right? So you cannot be, right? You cannot be the ACC commander without wearing what on your chest? Right? You cannot be probably, at least at this time, the chief staff of our Air Force without a similar type of thing, right? There's things that you're only going to go up to a certain level uh, based upon your functional community. But that's why I, I had to pause for a minute because, you know, the Chief Master Sergeant the Air Force, right? You can be the Chief Master Sergeant the Air Force, you can be a maintainer, you can be a personnel, you can be a dirt boy, <laughs> you can be a dental tech. You know what I mean? Heck, you can be the, the command chief for all things cyber with cyber wings on your chest now because you're no doubt an expert in this as a dental guy too. You know what I mean? So there's no barriers in our Air Force for you. So just make sure you understand it, whether that's in the functional chain or whether that's in uh, our uh, command chains with command chiefs. And last one is our 25th Air Force. And as you know, that's all of our uh, ISR, you know, our Intel surveillance reconnaissance, as well as all the big wing ISR. And then we have AFTEC, which uh, AFTEC does a lot of other things to, to include uh, nuclear uh, uh, oversight and, and some other different programs in there. But I can't talk about all of them. And it's got all of our scientists. So the young lady that he briefed the other day, the one came in as a PhD, that's where she works down at Patrick in AFTEC. But, the main reason I show you this is a very diverse command that we have. You know, there's a lot of things going on inside this command. Unlike other commands, they're either regionally focused or mission focused for the most part. But we're kind of across many mission sets. Not much different than any other uh, command staff and how we're organized. Uh, the one thing that we have done since adding uh, 24th Air Force is we matrixed our 236. We didn't change ours the same as the half did in going into a uh, two six, uh, we actually have a matrix organization. We still have a two, a three, and a six, but we have it within that organization to be able to get the synergies across our intel, our cyber, and our operations. Pretty easy mission set, right? I mean, it really is. I mean, that's when we think about all the things that our job is to organize, train, and equip those airmen to go do that mission. And exploit the air. And then what we just added, and this is 
our, our focus that you heard from the chief, uh, chief of staff the other day is getting back to things that we have lost and the electromagnetic spectrum is one of those, right? Through our uh, EC missions out of uh, EM and even within cyber, you know, it's, a, it's another piece where we, when you're talking about controlling the airspace and the electromagnetic spectrum, it's getting back to some of the basics that we're going to need when we go to these peer to peer fights in our future. Those are our priorities. Has everybody seen General Holmes' letters on these priorities? Nope. So uh, very much aligned with the Chief of Staff's priorities and the series that we went through yesterday. Number one being developing leaders. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more prior this afternoon on developing leaders, but we're trying to develop leaders inside of Air Combat Command to increase the lethality readiness, right? You hear those terms, but the way to do that is to have senior leaders in our Air Force that are focused on that mission, that organized, trained, and equipped, and understand the mission of the unit and understand how to align those forces and get them ready to go do the fight. So those things is the squadron superintendent course, those things is local flight leader courses, those things is developing talent across the talent management pool and ensuring that we have the right leaders going to the right places. All these things go into the development leadership. The next part, I, I start on, and I should look at my slide, I started at two. First one is increase the squadron readiness, right? That's the one we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Uh, but again, that's about resourcing, that's about organization. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about it when we talk about uh, uh, the, 12th Air, or the 12th Air Force, we'll talk about the 366, the Mountain Home Experiment. The, the things that we're doing inside of the command to break out the level of control, the level of authorities, decentralizing, uh, and pushing that down to the squadron command level, the whole intent of that is to just do the number one piece right there. Is to give a squadron commander the ability to control resources, to control authorities, to be able to get after things they need to do in their mission set to increase squadron readiness. And then you've seen this here too with our increase in focus on flying the flying hour program. Right? And it's not for any reason to fly laps around our base, right? It's Get after squadron readiness. In order to get after squadron readiness, we have to fly the amount of hours that are required to train pilots and to train air crews to then put demands on the system to continue to fund those at the right level and to continue to put demands on the system to continue the logistics trail from AFMC to be able to fund those so that we can continue to get after squadron readiness. Because doing the things that we're doing now and flying the same mission sets and flying the uh, program your, your hours, they pay you for 90% of your hours, they fund the logistics tail to 80% of your hours, and then we never end up getting out of this hole that we're in as far as air readiness. Last one is uh, bringing the future faster. This one's a little bit tougher. In my boss's discussions and in our staff's discussions, you'll hear a lot of it, a lot of it's focused on acquisition, right? And Secretary of the Air Force has talked about it. Uh, Dr. Roper was down at AFA talking about it, uh, trying to cut the transition or the acquisition timelines, right? Cutting hours and days out of the transition uh, acquisition timeline, give it, get to the future faster. When we're talking about whatever the next system is, whatever the next program is, whatever the next uh, uh, weapon system is, is getting there faster and, and cutting those transition times. In my world, I look at this more broadly. Future faster means everything in my world. If there's something, if there's a good idea out there, if there's a a uh, way that we need to change something. If we find out there's a stupid policy at ACC or the Air Force, and that to me is also bringing the future faster. It's working as diligently as we can to get after those things and fix those things and clear roadblocks for our Air It's not as easy as it sounds, you know what I mean? Because our bureaucratic uh, uh, system that we sit in doesn't always allow for rapid change. I always try and put a uh, deadline on things, you know what I mean? If we have something to put, hey, this is the projected uh, milestone that we have to meet, Sometimes that helps, uh, but as we can talk later about promotion and a senior rater endorsement, I don't know if I'm gonna get that across the line. Uh, but July 31st is the next time that we have to uh, push anybody for stratification and push EPRs. Those things to me are also bringing the future faster. You know, moving things, moving them at a fast rate, getting the things out of the way that are, are bogging down us. Getting after it. This just gets after the functions of the Air Force, and I don't know if you realize this, but so back in 1947 when we were created, Things really didn't change between now and then, except for we just realigned and renamed it. 
but we still have pretty much the same core functions that we were given when we stood up as an Air Force in 1947. Inside that, there's the core functions of the Air Force. And then when ACC, we have six of the core functions of the Air Force. There was a time where we talked about core function leads. And so you simply, prior to term simply was we stood up the Air Force Warfighter Integration uh, uh, capabilities up at the Air Force level. The purpose of that is to be able to bring all of that planning piece into it in the beginning to then get after the budgeting after so they can plan for the future in these core functions. Uh, so there's some things inside Air Combat Command that we'll stop doing with regard to the core function management because we've given up 50 people to go up to AFWIC to do that. But these are the core functions that we're responsible for. This is just a map to show you that uh, I was talking to a, a, a person yesterday who might be even in the crowd, right? Somebody was out at Cannon. And I was like, man, look at the people at Cannon. They're like, they're the chief. And I said, oh, crap, that's right. The 363rd has a, a squadron out there. We got people at Herbert. We got people at Fort Bragg. There's not many places across uh, this globe that you don't find an Air Combat Command airman. So uh, it's just to give you, I, I don't always talk about the size. But I do like to rub it in now and again with my peers. You know, we sit around this table I told you about, the Air Force Senior Enlisted Leadership Council, and we all get the same vote, right? Sometimes I wish we voted by the number of naps we had, and then maybe we can move to the future faster. Uh, but we don't get that. I guarantee you, we were joking about this last night, uh, the, the one program that we do a really good job about uh, or with as far as equal equality across the commands is step promotion. You know, so when we do step promotion allocations, we base those upon the number of staff sergeants and senior airmen you have, senior airmen, eligible senior airmen you have in your command. So we get a greater allocation. Of course, that doesn't help us any either when we do the OCN taskings. We do that based upon the eligible staff sergeants and below that are DW coded, and we end up with a good amount of those. But there are fair share across. But then you throw in other programs, you know, OAY. 12 OAY, you know, ACC ends up with one. You go to uh, Select P, Select O, right? Senior Leader Enlisted Commissioning Program. Well, you know, one program that if you have the degree, one if you if you don't. Every match commander gets one in one. You know, and I'm like, hey, really? You got 100,000 there, but we don't get more? Anyway, we're still pushing for more on things like that. We support all those commands. Those are the operations that we're going in right now. You know, we have airmen deployed to every one of these locations, whether deployed or we have jets in those locations, flying missions currently uh, supporting the needs of those combatant commanders. General Holmes and I have uh, identified that, in, in identifying that the one combatant command that we, we frequently visit and frequently uh, engage with, at least on the absent component, or, or the CENTCOM is the absent component. And uh, I think both of us identified a little bit of a blind spot is the more interaction with those uh, combatant commands that we provide forces to uh, to build those relationships and strengthen those uh, uh, relationships so that we can ensure that our airmen are taken care of and that we're providing their needs. We were just down at uh, Southcom, uh, Chief Storms and General Croft were down there with us. Uh, and then we went up to CENTCOM and we'll have some other business in the future getting out to these combatant commands. We're organized a little bit differently with regard to the combatant commands. So on the regional ones, right, so you have USA Impact F, you realize that they're the, they're the uh, uh, Air Force component to those command, commands. That's why, you know, Pacific Air Force is uh, European as well as AF Africa. AFSOC, you know, has got the habitual relationship with SOCOM. AMC has that relationship with uh, uh, TRANSCOM. Uh, but our command does not have a habitual relationship. We do not take that role on as a MAGCOM. We're building some of that on the relationship side. But that's our component piece, right? So you got Chief Clink and his boss are our component that goes to Cybercom. He goes to Southcom. We have one that goes to Norcom. We have one that goes to Centcom. So we don't do that as a command, per se. We rely on our, our number of air forces to do that based upon the size and, and the spread of where we're operating. Prepare for the future is just a cool slide, I guess, I don't know why. <coughs> That's what we're going for, right? The threads, you guys got the NDS brief the other day. I'm sure you're familiar with it. But the whole point is to develop people, develop leaders, uh, to ensure that our airmen are ready to go for this peer-to-peer uh, -peer competition. These are some, some things that we're working on. Many of you may see your mission set in one of those boxes as we're going forward. Advanced Battle Management System, this is what 
we're looking to replace. The current means of that is that JSTARS does a lot of this as well as there's other pieces to it, but a lot of people will relate this to JSTARS, right, as we determine not to recapitalize that, that weapon system it's because we felt we'd be buying new old and those radars won't be able to get to the place we need them to get to to be able to give us the, uh, the essay and the, the decision-making information to be able to move forward. So this is really looking more at something that could be a lower orbit, something that could be a platform that can survive in those contested environments. Agile communication, same thing, right? As you go forward into a, a contested environment, you have to have something that, that is agile, flexible, and, and, and isn't going to be either jammed, blocked, degraded, uh, through the system, so that's what we're talking about there. Core function team transition, that's what I talked to you about with the AFWIC. With those 50 personnel that we shifted up, now what we want to do with our staff is ensure they're focusing on things and thinking through problem sets that the Air Force is in. AOC, many of you, we talked about it with uh, uh, the big uh, one of the big rocks yesterday. You know, we got the Shadow OC out at Nellis and we're working through some of these things. DTOT, what we're trying to do with DTOT is DT typically happens, right? And then they give it to OT, and then OT does something, and OT finds a problem, and then has to give it back to DT, and then DT goes. We're trying to do a little bit more synergy between us and AFMC to be able to do some collaborative DT, OT stuff to bring that feature faster and kind of move through that same. Multi-domain, C2, ISR, you guys are very familiar about the multi-domain as far as what we were just talking yesterday with the focus uh, rocks, but just being able to ensure that we can provide that across all the systems. Uh, dynamic force employment, have you guys heard that term? discussed within the NDS, we're talking about being able to maybe not have a, a, a continuous presence in areas, but be able to, to send a force at our time and at our place and drop it in and actually do some missions there and come out. We're going to do some things in Europe. We've actually talked about it when we're uh, looking at uh, uh, AFSENT. You know, we pulled our F-22s out of AFSENT due to readiness, due to uh, trying to bring them back up on their readiness levels. But that's a potential, right, that you can take a uh, six Raptors and you could drop it in somewhere. You could take, you know, some F-35s out of hill and you could spin up and you could just drop it in somewhere. Uh, there's room for that in all of the combatant commands that we support, but that's what the, the dynamic force employment means. Uh, o, OA, DCGS, uh, do I have any people in here from my DCGS enterprise? Sure I have, you guys are very much more familiar with this than I am, so I'll, I'll stumble my way through it. But basically what we want to do is open this platform up to be able to be more app-based and be able to have a way to where we can update things and put things into the system and give them a better system to operate on. It's been a long thing running and we haven't gotten there yet, but we're still pushing the ball forward to get there. Operational training infrastructure and uh, total force integration. Total force integration is more on what we do as far as the command. Is, who, do I have anybody in here from uh, from one of our active associates? <coughs> I thought I had one person here from one of our active associates. Are, are, are you all aware, I know the people in the front row, that we have uh, seven fighter squadrons in, inside of ACC that are active associates, which means they are located at a guard or reserve base. And an uh, increase in the TFI uh, relationships is important to us because that's how we're going to go and we're going to take care of any of these. You know, we're talking joint, but we're also talking TFI, so we have a good relationship across the TFI. That's it, that's your comment. It's easy. It's an easy job. There's not much going on. It doesn't look as busy at all. I'll give you just my perspective on the command. I'm being filmed, so I guess I should watch this. So, as your Air Combat Command Command Chief, at times I feel that, the, that, that we're underrepresented with many of our functions in some of these OPTs and other planning and, and way forward. I think within our staff, I think things are happening at the nug work level, right, and, and getting after it. But I'll tell you, and I feel very underrepresented sometimes in our, I go to so many meetings, right? I'm the only enlisted guy in those meetings, you know? I wish I had more director superintendent support now and again. But what I want you to know is that you have to be in those meetings, right? So in your world, as a squadron superintendent that you're going to be, or whatever your role is going to be as you as you chief on. There's a lot of times where you just want to go do the cool things, right? What they say, man, stripes on the line, i got to be out there with my airmen, i got to be doing this, i got to do that. But if you're not in the meetings that are deciding the future of our Air Force, the future of your squadron, the future of your readiness, you're missing a 
big, big point what your job is. Uh, there, there's so many times, and I, I don't do this to pat myself on the back, but General Holmes one time, I, I didn't know where he was going with it, man. He's sitting in the meeting, I'm sitting next to him where I always am, and he walks in, I forget what the topic of the meeting, but it was, it was something that you, know, you wouldn't expect, you know, that, that the enlisted guys could be sitting in the meeting for, right? I mean, that, you know, that's what that was. And, uh, he looked and he was talking to the crowd, he says, you know what? He said, there's times that I walk into a meeting and I wonder to myself, What's the chief? You know, what wonder why the chief's in this meeting. And then he opens his mouth. And I realize why he's in the meeting. You mean because you're gonna be the one that can see things that maybe didn't grow up in the same community, and then that speak truth to power, right? That you, you know because you've already had a sidebar with that person about what they're really trying to get across, and you can sense from the meeting that it didn't <laughs> go in the direction they wanted it to go in, or maybe what you just heard Comac say, you're looking at the room and you're like, I don't think that they really heard what he just said. And you're just the one to say, hey boss, I just want to clarify with you for just a minute. What you said about that is what you meant, right? Oh, no, 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 Chief. What I meant was this. That's the reason that you have to be in those teams. That's the reason that you have to be represented. That's what I do on a daily basis. Uh, they're not always, uh, sometimes I'm, <laughs> I'm the same way, right? I walk into meetings sometimes and I say, damn, why am I in this meeting again? And then I realized by the end of it why I was in the meeting because it was something that I needed to be either informed on or I needed to inform uh, the, the decision makers inside of that meeting, that meeting on the way forward for air combat. What do you all have for me with regard to either that brief or, or anything going on across the command or anything shoot? We can talk about anything you want. We got about another uh, 20 minutes or something like that before I turn it over to Chief Wade. I just wanted to lead this off and then lead off some discussion to start today. Nobody, man, nobody has any questions. Yeah, go ahead. What's the future of the 22s on the side? Yeah, so the, the current feature of the F-22s was to, was to increase the squadron Let's increase the squadrons that are currently existing to get after ribbons, right? Uh, bring them back up to the PA that was required to be able to do the training requirements that they need. So, you know, we took uh, the, the combat coded aircraft and we flooded those back out up to the first fighter wing to uh, out to Hawaii and then up to Elmendorf to be able to get after that. And the FTU, because of uh, proximity to the ranges and proximity to the LO facilities that are already established at Tyndall that we think we'll be able to bring back up. Uh, we decided to move the FTU on a temporary basis uh, to Eglin. And then we're doing a SATAP, we're doing other studies to determine where the final resting place for that uh, FTU will be. It could be back at Tyndall, I don't think so, based upon the Secretary's discussion about wanting to turn that to an M35 base. Uh, there are some that think Langley seems like the perfect spot for it, but we don't want to get ahead of uh, the process of doing it, and we don't want to get ahead of notification to our congressional leaders on that and just feel like it's a preordained thing. There have been letters uh, signed by uh, many of uh, congressmen and, and women that are, you know, saying, hey, this is the best place for, you know, these F-22s to go as they would like to have them inside of their uh, districts. Uh, Hickam would make it probably a little bit costly. I think uh, Alaska would do the same, but there may be another location that we, we don't have much. So I want to preordain the same like this would be the spot. That's what it is. And then Tyndall is going to be right the, the I know I have people in here from Tyndall, but you know it was a horrific, you know, tragic event to go in there and wipe, you know, people's lives completely off of uh, the foundations. The opportunity that, that presented to us was though is to go forward and try and build the base of the future, right? start from the ground up and say, hey, what would we do if we could start over with infrastructure, with our comm infrastructure as we're looking for enterprise IT as a service, uh, facilities, you know, all of those things. Uh, so I think that's what the opportunity is at Tindall is to make that a, a great base and to bring your prep back in and open some effort in box. Yes, sir. Hey, Chief, is the RPA wing still a, a part of that plan? Go to yeah, so that's part of the discussion, right? So we've already done that, that uh, SATAP, that discussion. That, that was the best choice, right? There were two uh, feasible choices for that location, and Tindall was the number one. 
we feel that in order to, to keep faith with that community and uh, the, uh, the studies that we had done, that we need to keep moving in that direction. But until we get everything back on what the future of Tyndall is going to be and how we're going to build that, we can't say that yes, right? But there may be opportunities to do something else with that wing out on the East Coast because we have a group out there already at Shaw. So uh, I would think that yes, that would be what we would like to do within Air Combat Command because that is where we're going with it. It may give us a better opportunity also to put, those, put the right foundation and structures and organize it the right way too. Going to other places, we have issues. There was talk, well, what if we just went to Eglin? Well, Eglin would be issues with that the same way we had a fight with AFMC just about the range space and everything in the beginning to go out there. The other location, the problem with the other location that we were working through was housing, uh, local area housing. You know, the secretary, all the service secretaries sent out a great letter to the congressional leadership saying, hey, you know, we want you all to know that, you know, as we look through basin actions and we look through things, it's not just about the mission. It's not just about if you have two runways. It's about what do you provide the local area. You know, what, how are your schools ranked? What's the housing situation? Those are the decisions. What's the spouse you know, work and licensing procedures? Those are going to be what's going to go into our decision as well as is it the right place to fly and conduct our missions. You know, what you see is that uh, uh, they're moving out on that. You know, many states, Utah just did a uh, reciprocity uh, bill that they passed, much like your driver's license. So. You know, when you go from state to state to state, right, you don't go get a new driver's license because you're a resident here and here's your, your license. So basically that's what Hill did is they said, hey, if you have a license in another state, you basically are going to be okay if you're an active uh, military spouse. And there's other ones. It's not just them. Uh, uh, North Dakota just passed something through the House. I think it still has to get through the Senate. I know Florida has some uh, amenities for uh, the same way for uh, active duty military spouses. So, and you know, Secretary, we were out at uh, Holloman. Anybody from Holloman? Oh, they're not us anymore. So. <laughs> I, I didn't mean that as a joke. I mean, uh, but uh, we were out at Holloman, and she was talking up at the Space Museum, and I was here right up there. It was all the leadership there, the local leadership, the congressional leadership from their district. And she said, you know, I'm also not just comparing the school system here to like, you know, Tularosa or to Carlsbad or something, right? Like she wants to compare that school system to the same that you would get in Arlington, Virginia, or you know what I mean? Like the, you, you don't get to just get a wave on it because of the area you're in. Your school system should be up to the level that we want our children. That's one of the biggest things that we get right on assignments. Uh, one of the fear complaints when you get certain assignments is the schools that are available. Right there. Name any of our bases. It is the case for most. What else? Yeah, go ahead. In the same vein as the RPA, so I haven't heard a lot about the listed house and how successful that program has been, and if it has been successful, are you looking at increasing going more? Yeah, that's a good question. So the initial plan was 100, right? 100 positions within those organizations, both at Beale and at uh, Grand Forks, inside of the RQ4 uh, mission set. Uh, to my knowledge, those those enlisted pilots are performing well. They're doing just as well as anybody would have expected them to. Nobody had a doubt in their mind that the capabilities of an enlisted person to do that mission, they wouldn't need it. There's been no discussion about growing that mission set. And there's been no discussion with Air Combat Command to spread that into other areas. There has been discussion outside of Air Combat Command. I know within some of the functional areas there's been discussion to do that. I'll give you my thought on it. I think it's a great program. I think it's a great initiative to show, you know, the, the capabilities of enlisted force. But I don't know how you can ever solve a pilot shortage or a, an air crew shortage by putting the person into the job that you're actually paying less. To. I mean, like I, I can maybe grow more enlisted pilots, but if I'm not paying them and there's a draw on the outside for them, then how do I keep them at staff sergeant pay that I can't keep a major pay guy? I can pay the bonuses equally, but there's still a base pay that I can't do. And I know we're working through some of the bonus challenges also uh, as they're coming up. We also built it a little bit funny, right? So I think there's frustration, to be honest with you. Like, do I have any enlisted pilots? Anybody in that community in here? Anybody else? I think, there's a, I think there's frustration within the community, and I think the frustration is because of how we built it. I think every one of them should have went into this eyes wide open to know what they're 
what they're getting into and pay wise and all these things. I think the reality is once they got into the units and they saw they're sitting next to the person and they're doing the same thing and getting paid less, that was frustrating to them. I think they also are frustrated by the fact that we went in a heavy dose of senior NCOs in the beginning because we wanted it to succeed, right? So we picked the right people that, that could lead this program off from the beginning and it could succeed. What happens when you build a 100 person enlisted course in the career field and you start by filling all of the top ranks first? Okay, for about five years. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it's great, except for when they go in there and all they're doing is flying the line because their job right now is to learn how to be, like, be a lieutenant and fly the line. They want to know, hey, when am I going to start being treated like a senior NCO or all the responsibility? Well, you're not right now because you're flying the line. And then you throw in all the tech sergeants that come behind them and then they start looking and say, hey, where are my promotion opportunities? Because all the freaking billets are already building above me. So there are some things we have to work through there. But we're going to continue on the path that we're on, but I don't see it expanding. Go ahead. So on that same thing, when the gentleman talked about uh, professional officers in, in a DCQ, mm -hmm. is there any discussion about professional enlisted? Since they want to keep that same continuity throughout? Well, Chief Albers talked a little bit about that yesterday, right? So there, if you guys. You all hear, so the, the, the command and control piece to it, yes, and there's some one end piece to it, yes, that they, they can get that M prefix, or M, is it a prefix or a suffix, I forget, but the SEI, and they can then find themselves in that AOC environment, you know, and that's where they're going to live their lives at. Uh, the other ones, the other one, Charlie's and stuff, that kind of flow in and out of that, and we'll get some sort of an SEI to where we're tapped, to where we can use that as talent management. On the officer side, it's different. They're talking about a new AFSC. To be able to, to go to as a volunteer at a certain point in your career, and then you'll track into that. I personally, again, our, our Air Force is very functionally stovepipe, right? Like, I talked to uh, Stafford. I don't know if you know Chief Stafford. He was up there doing that focus area prior to Albert doing it. I thought there was room to grow in that way and make a one Charlie whatever, you know, and, and combine it, whether it's an attack the uh, an arm, any of those kind of one Charlie command and control issues. Uh, career fields that you could track those to then be an AOC superintendent be the AOC guy because you track they don't want to do that because then what happens to the one it's the one Charlie three I think it's the group I'm talking about uh, well then they lose maybe 13 of their chief slots right because now those become functionally agnostic and anybody can fill them and you know there's always a little bit of a fight it's just like turning a group superintendent from a, a 1N or a 3D functional group into a 9G so we can have more diversity in that group and it's you know you got to go to career field manager and they're giving up it's like i'm taking one of their children you know to, to make them uh, uh, and in a sense i understand it because of their role and how they're trying to develop their career field so i understand yes yeah, sir what the efforts is trying to improve squadron readiness is there been more talks about trying to go forward with this Conversation has changed much like from the past few years when you and I talked about this in the past where you know, we're getting decimated. So you know, I have a unit of 275 people, 59 of them have assignments, 95% of them are going to Korea. And then you know you look at the return investment, so when I look at the same time return, it was uh measuring numbers, it seemed, you know, Is there movement? No. Is there discussion? Yes. Are we looking at ensuring that when we plan for the future that we're taking this into account in a, in a better way than what we've done within the F-16 community? Yes. So that's why we're, we're looking at the laydown of F-35s. That's why this Tyndall piece, again, tragic event, but it gives us an opportunity to reset some areas. And we can drop three new squadrons of F-35s there. We have three at Hill, which gives us now six CONUS to balance out the O CONUS that we're projecting. Where we're at right now with F-16s is what? How many CONUS, right? And how many overseas? So it's an imbalance. So we don't have a way to feed from a CONUS. Now, I'm, I, we have active associates on the margins. We've got Holloman, you know, doing some uh, uh, F-16. You know what I mean, so there are some margins that we can feed those fights. Uh, but it's really about how we rebalance it. Heck, man, uh, I know the summit uh, ended a little bit early, but if we could get peace to break out in Korea, who knows, man? There's 
you know, a couple squatters of F-16s there, maybe we wouldn't need on the pen anymore that we could go in with a DFE style, right? Uh, but I'm not saying that we're pulling any forces out of Korea, I don't put that out. I'm just saying that, you know, so the future on how we're doing our force laid down the hill. But it's not just the F-16s, right? So if you look at the C, you know, uh, F-15Cs are kind of in the same way. All theirs are low Tony's assignments. The, the striking was probably our most balanced. You know what I mean? With the with the assignments abroad compared to the assignments at home and allowing that, that pipeline. But no, we have I don't part of it would be put an assignment availability codes on it, but then we we'd find ourselves in a place where we're not filling those OCONUS assignments. Or we're gonna have longer OCONUS tours, right? Where we'd have to keep those individuals also down uh, in the say Kunsan Osan for a longer period of time. Now I, I know I'm, I'm, I said no, but then I'm you at the top. But uh, the other thing though, it's a career field piece though too, right? So we're looking at it from a career field management side of the house to where, you know, you have people that can take themselves out of the hunt for 10 years of having to go from, you know, Shaw to Kusan, Shaw to Kusan. You can have people that can get themselves out of the hunt for 10 years. How? Well, you get a, a four-year tour over to Aviano or Spain, and then you get in uh, Dipcot, you stay another four years, and then you get orders to Shaw. Well, then I got to be two years on station before you hit me anyway. That's 10 years that I didn't have to. You know what I mean, so the career fields are looking at that to balance whether or not they'll approve those continuous overseas tour assignments or say, nope, sorry, buddy, you got to get back in the fight. We did discuss for a while whether or not you should be able to go and be non involved from a OCONUS assignment to those, uh, but it's, there's a lot of different pieces that, because if you have a family and you're, you know, in Aviano and then sponsorship piece and your what we do with your family and how do we, so there we've talked about it we just haven't been here. what else I'll go right there and then right here. Okay, so um, my question is so you know we, we said we wanted to get to NCAA and right? we're going to get all our aircraft yep. um, however there's a lack of parts yep. um, that we're all experiencing which you know that doesn't matter which MBS come from. Um, what are we doing with our industry partners like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, um, Pratt and Whitney to hold them accountable and, and say we need these parts. We can't wait until there's a you know need for thousands of these components to then for you to get a contract to build them. Yeah. You know, I mean when we're canning off of you know aircraft that are already in the bone yard, <coughs> you know, there's a big gap there. Yeah, I, I think it's twofold. One is there's a there's a pressure piece to it, right? On the so AFMC really is our lead on this, right? The sustainment piece of it is, is so there's an aircraft improvement plans. They've had these for years, right? So your SPO and all of them have these aircraft improvement plans. This is you know where we're supposed to be. This is where we're at, and there's supposed to be a plan, right, to get from here to there. And there really hasn't been a lot of attention on this. General Miller R A four has brought a lot of attention on this. And now COMAC is actually getting briefed these aircraft improvement plans from AFMC and they're also going up to the chief staff and they're being briefed. So now, so the pressure is to, let's develop a plan to find out what it is we need to do inside of our sustainment side to get us to our readiness side in our 80. And if we brief a plan and we're confirmed to the plan, we have to do it. The other piece that you mentioned is uh, uh, our industry partners, right? It's all in that same realm as providing pressure. We also have to not uh, give them easy outs, right? So when we go and we deploy a, a, a squadron or a group of F-35s to Kadena, but then we use gray tails to bring parts in instead of holding Lockheed to the fire, you know I mean, to ensure that Lockheed's getting those parts to us in a timely manner, we have to watch that. We're talking the same thing as we're getting ready to uh, position F-35s into the absent AOR, is that, hey, we, this, this can't be a, uh, uh, an internal that, hey, we're going to try and work around it. Because that's what we do as the Air Force, right? Hey, we can't get these parts here, DHA, uh, DHL or whoever it is Lockheed's using, or they, they can't see, let's us get them there in time. Let's us do it. We don't want to do that. We want to hold them to the, their feet to the fire and let them meet their contractual requirements or explain to us how they're going to get a plan to meet their contractual uh, requirements. The other part of it is that we have to be smart in, uh, in not burn our, burn our uh, uh, supply chains out and burn, you know, so one in particular is F-22, right? So when you look at the engine 
uh, issues that we're having with the F-22 on our current uh, uh, glide slope with our deployed aircraft and the next squadron was gonna go in and uh, uh, fill that hole, we were gonna start running out of engines in those aircraft. So we made a deliberate determination and worked with AFSIN to say, hey, this rotation we're not gonna have covered down on that. They're gonna find other ways to cover down on that with other you know, uh, force providers. And then we're gonna be able to fly those aircraft at, the, at, at a sustainable rate to still get after our MC-80 versus trying to fly this and fly that. So we have to balance uh, all those requirements both on how much we're flying them as well as what we're going to sustain. So does that make sense? But, but it's not something that's, that's an easy solution. But the nice thing is right now we have this goal that we're able to use this goal from the SecDAF and SecDAF on to be able to push everybody to meet those goals. Chief, just curious, how close are we to implementing any of those physical fitness changes that we've discussed? And just something that we can see. Very it's all just been briefed right now. I'm not aware of, of, of they, they briefed the AFSEL. self. Uh, they came in and briefed the command chief orientation. They briefed you guys, and I think he's coming back. Although we can have to figure out the time, how long he stays on stage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a great man, and he has a lot of information. But, but, if, but if you're giving two hours and you want to give questions, you got to stop talking an hour and a half to take questions. Uh, but we'll figure that part of it out. But I haven't heard of anything as far as going in front of Corona. I can I can ping Chief right on that and figure it out. I'm a fan of many of the changes that you're talking about. I like the piece with the test anxiety, giving people that 45 day window to be able to uh, do it. I like the, did he talk about the factor, you know, the height weight factor yeah. piece. Because uh, the VO2 max is really a VO2 max and it gets you away from saying, well, I'm a really tall guy. And, you know, I shouldn't be penalized because my waist is this big. Well, it'll give you the same factor, you know, as, as, a, as a shorter person. And then the tiering ones, those are already moving out on. There was discussion on the maintenance side of the house. We, were, we had a, a sidebar yesterday, you know, maintenance is one that he has up there. I, I haven't heard anybody inside of maintenance saying we're going to a, a, a functional <laughs> test. I, it, to be honest, I don't, I don't understand. I understand security forces. I understand EOD. I understand fire. Uh, I understand our special warfare uh, airmen. Uh, maintenance is, to say maintenance is like saying, well, we're going to do an MSG uh, functional test. MSG, holy crap, how many AFSCs are in MSG? Same with maintenance, right? Yeah. A sheet metal guy, an avionics guy, a P-mail guy, a, a scheduler, a, who, 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 what, what are we, we already have lift things, you know, if you, you have to lift a certain amount of weight and things like that in order to grab a toolbox. I don't see that happening. The random one, I kind of like that too, right? Uh, just saying, hey, we're gonna have a DDR style type of a uh, fitness test. But I don't have to do, but like five of them a week, two of them a week. You know, that's just enough of a deterrent to where people think, oh crap, man, I might get picked today. The spreading out the timeline is I think the biggest win. But as we discussed at dinner last night, if you spread out the timeline, right, to get all the efficiencies of not doing all those tests, but then everybody goes in to take an early test on their 45 day mark, you know what I mean? And then it takes another test because they didn't pass that one, then you end up, you know, it, it can balance out. I don't, I think it'll, I don't think everybody's going to do the 45 day piece uh, because I think it's going to shift their dates too, right? If you're an October person, you don't want to go and get your test in September and the next year get it in July and now you're like, oh crap, now I got a test in July, so damn hot. Chief, question about PR. So with the PJs, a piece of the triad leaving yeah. ACC, so the PJs leaving, um, it leaves half the triad or a third of the two thirds of the triad without that core piece of it. How does that affect, or what is the discussions on how that's going to affect us and our ability to execute that mission? And what is the discussion on the future of rescue? Is the rest? Uh, we know they've kicked the can for a couple years, but yeah. that also creates an identity crisis within PR as well. Yeah, I guess it's a different where you sit. You know, what was the phrase? Where you sit is where you stand, or something like that. So your yep, view you on go. it, I understand it. Uh, <coughs> I was the 23rd Wing Command Chief for, for a couple years, so I had a little bit of knowledge of the community through that and at the 9th Air Force. Currently within our PR, that, that one leg of the triad anyway, the 38th Rescue Squadron does not always deploy with the 41st Rescue Squadron, you know what I mean? But they do a, a spin up with those units they're gonna go to, so they, they go and they uh, perform with them. And I think that's going to be a similar type of thing, right? There's still going to be a synergy and a relationship that's built between the special 
uh, tactics squadrons and, and being able to have those spin-ups and have those exercises that prepare crews to work together. You know, right now in Bagram, we have CH-47s over there that our PJs are operating, operating on, right? And they did the same kind of thing. They did a spin-up train. I thought it was forgetting the, the unit that's flying. Uh, I think it's Hawaii. I think it's Hawaii Yard that's out there. You know, so they went and did some spin-up exercises to be able to do it. It's back and forth on the on the HH-60s and the HCs, right, going over uh, into AFSOC. I think out of the two, I think the HCs would be a good piece of it, right, because they would find a lot of synergy with the MC community. They go through much of the same training, uh, at least the flying part of it. I think HH-60, I think they're they're concerned about being lost and not being, I mean, I did feel like maybe a stepbrother or a, a stepchild or something like that. Uh, I, I, I think that we're, we're going to do no harm in my my thought process and how I've been uh, going through it when we present forces. I think we'll still find the synergies we need to conduct the training we need to do the things that we need to do that. The platforms will still be available to those squatters uh, on the special <coughs> side of the house to do all that stuff that they need to be able to do. And maybe it, maybe it frees up a little bit more air crew time to be able to get after, you know, because there's always been a draw, right? That's why, you know, you go out to DM and they've got their own little trainer inside of their building there to be able to do some things they need to do uh, with plant fans blowing on them and stuff because they can't always get the, the aircraft availability. So it might be better. Another thing we're looking at is whether or not we need to have uh, the squadron at, at Nellis the way we do. Now this is going to be an iron bill, right? We'd like to have the squadron up at Nellis be focused on the, just the weapons squadron up there, right? And those are those aircraft there, maybe pull those remaining aircraft to DM and be more robust and consolidate in the east and west coast type of a operation uh, to find synergies there. Take one more question and then we'll take a quick break. Yes, sir. We talked about the future of the F-22 and what they're doing. Um, we talked about the future of the F-22 and the, I'd, I'd like to know what, what the A-10 is. A-10, man, like. that question always comes up, man. If you're downrange, this funny, we were in Bagram, and uh, no, Canar, of course Canar, because the A-10 were Canar. And uh, the guys, the KC Hogs were there. Uh, I think it's the KC Hogs that are there right now. Uh, man, them guys, shoot man, every day at lunch, at breakfast, at, hey, what's the future of A-10? Uh, it's probably the best community that loves their aircraft, man, and doesn't ever want to see it ever retire. I'm talking 50 years from now, they still want to be flying A-10s. So, what we put forward in the budget, and it's not been approved, but what we put it forward in the budget was the, to keep 200, I think it's 218, down from 280 something. That's where we could afford the wings, right? For those aircraft to re-wing and restructure the aircraft. That's where, where the crowd, that's where the, the piece is with it, is that those wings are running out of hours on them, to where structurally they're not sound, so we have to re-wing. Uh, so that's what we're looking at, and what, what, what that'll cost, right? So you, obviously we're losing A-10s, but when we re-wing re them, we're talking you're good for what, another 20 years, you know, or something like that. So we're going to keep the A-10 in our inventory for a long period of time. It's just going to be, there'll be some squadrons that'll come down based upon those numbers. I don't know if that'll be on the active duty side or on the reserve side or guard side of the house. I imagine it's probably going to be in our art component and those would be transitions to other airframes. I think there was already one that was planning to come down uh, based upon that, and I thought they were transitioning to C-130s or something like that, but there's on the guard reserve side of the house. So there is some uh, transition. A-10 is going to be with us for some time. Just know, man, when, when General Welsh and the team, you know, when our senior leadership made the decision about the A-10 before, they got schwacked for it, you know what I mean, by everybody and their brother. Man, they weren't saying the A-10 wasn't a great aircraft and doing good things. They were saying, hey, with what I've been given, as far as resources, and what I'm looking at is a future fight. I have to make a, a, I have to pick the best worst choice, right? And I'm saying, okay, we'll stop flying A-10s because I don't have enough manpower, money, blah 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 blah. And of course, then we took all those maintenance billets, we didn't take the aircraft, and now we built our maintenance capacity back up. But uh, it was just a decision that they were faced at the time. But the A-10 is going to be with us for a while. Uh, it's actually. You know, it goes to that light attack experiment too, right? We'll end up with probably some of those aircraft this year, but not the amount that we had talked about, but probably a, a handful uh, to be able to utilize them for some other requirements. But it, it's, it's basically it's cheaper for us to do what we're doing with the A-10 probably than to 
try and find something else on a turboprop side of the house to do kind of that light and tag. Hey, why don't we take a break? We'll take. For the best brief you're going to have all week. Either that or I'm going to set the bar kind of low and, and I'll, I'll do that for my partners that are going to brief later today. And we'll go like this throughout the day, you know. One of the two. We'll see how that goes. Uh, as Chief Batten said, I'm, I'm Chief Dave Wade. I'm, I'm at Ninth Air Force. And, and let me just start off by saying, hey, thanks, Chief Batten, for having us out on MASHCOM Day. I appreciate that. I've got more than a couple friends, you know, here at this conference on my Facebook, right? Yeah, Don Pedro, he's over there on it probably right now. And, 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 I, said, and I said Facebook and he went, what? He's one of them. So I saw everybody having fun, you know, come Monday or so, right? Saw all those pictures popping up and Chief Batten invited us out. So, you know, we get to take part in that a little bit too. I was a little bit jealous and I'm glad that I got to come out and and uh, wow everybody with the JTF discussion. All right, so um, hey, those are some good questions that I heard on the, in the ACC when uh, Chief Batten was up here talking and asking questions, you know. I gotta tell you, you know, operational questions. And that's, those are the kind of questions that we should be getting, that should be giving to the ACC Command Chief. I like that, so um, I think that's different than what we might have heard 10 years ago. There might be a question about, hey, uh, when's the OCP coming out, right? Yeah. <laughs> be uniform questions. I'd say, is, are we in the First Art Academy or are we at Chief Orientation, right? So that's good. Everybody feeling okay for day four? I know how I feel at day four, All right? Um, so hang with me, okay? I'll try to make this interesting. All right, I'll do my level best. We'll get started. So, uh, Ninth Air Force JTF headquarters capability. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, that Chief of Staff of the Air Force guidance. I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Are, has anybody heard about the JTF headquarters stand up in ACC in the past? Has anybody heard a little bit about that? One hand, two hands. Okay, good. That gives me an idea of uh, how I need to do my brief, okay? So I'm going to talk about really two things, this JTF staff basic course here, and then the JTF headquarters capability, and then I'm going to wrap it up with maybe some things for us to think about as we move forward, because I think everybody plays at least a, a small role in what I'm talking about here, okay? Wanted to start off uh, with a quick story. Um, you can read the slides as I talk. So. Does anybody remember the Ebola crisis a few years back? You know, West Africa, Ebola pops up and we go, hey, we need a JTF. And here's the story as I heard it. Secretary of Defense says, hey, we need a JTF. We need to respond to this Ebola crisis. Um, who's on the GERF? Global Response Force. Chief of Staff of the Air Force said, hey, sir, hold on a second. We think that for this mission, you're going to need logistics. You need air, you're going to need medical, you're going to need security. And oh, by the way, the United States Air Force does all those things pretty darn well. Why doesn't the United States Air Force run that JTF? To which the Secretary of Defense responded, how are you going to do that? He said, well, we're going to go out there, we're going to grab ourselves a two-star general, we'll build up the staff around them, we'll, we'll reach out and we'll get all these experts and we'll build that staff together and you know, in three weeks, we'll have our team. The Secretary of Defense said, Gary Valeski and the 101st can leave tomorrow. And that's when the Chief Staff of the Air Force was like, we need a JTF headquarters capability that's ready right now on the GERF and can do missions that the Air Force would be good at. So this is a, a quote from the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, 20 September, 2016. Our nation requires this Air Force to be able to step up and lead these joint campaigns. And so we're going to start with 9th Air Force. We're going to build that into a core JTF staff. And we're going to certify that commander as JTF commander, and that commander and that core staff is going to build the lexicon and the daily battle rhythm of a JTF into its daily operations, and that's what we've been doing at 9th Air Force for the better part of a couple years. 
Down here at the bottom, Air Force Future Operating Concept and Strategic Master Plan, JTF Headquarters designed to synergize all components embodied with the global perspective, stand up lead and support a JTF purposefully and systematically, gain proficiency in joint warfare, evolve the composition and training of our organization's employees at JTF, certify the commander and staff as a core JTF headquarters at the operational level of war, provides trans-regional, multi-domain, multi multi-function capabilities across the range of military operations. So that's pretty important right there, service retained. We think that airmen are going to be pretty good at running JTF headquarters. Have we been in the JTF business before? Absolutely. We've been doing this a long time. But with a core United States Air Force service retained headquarters, that's not something that we've done in the past. So we think we're going to be pretty good at that. Service retained, GERF aligned. That's pretty important too. GERF, you saw DFE in the ACC uh, brief, Dynamic Force Employment. You might hear terms like IRF, Immediate Response Force, uh, Contingency Response Force, SURF. Those are all terms that go along with Global Response Force as, as we have today. Multi-domain and mu multifunctional. The Chief of Staff's direction to us was, you're not going to be aligned to a COCOM, and you got to be that last sentence, across the range of military operations, prepared to do that. So at the lower end, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, security cooperation, maybe enforcement of no-fly zone, maybe integrated air missile defense, all the way up to kinetic warfare, be ready for anything, and that's the path that we're on, because that's the guidance we got from Chief Staff of the Air Force. Chief Staff of the Air Force, Guidance Headquarters, 9th Air Force, Transforms, Service Retained, GERF Aligned, JTF Capable. You know, this, this line isn't, uh, I don't have a bullet up here for TFI, but I think it's really important that I take a second to talk about that. We are fully dependent on total force integration to make this work. It says we must maintain our current OT and E day job. That means when we're not on the GERF, every third year or so we might be vulnerable to deploy. There's two years where we're training, but we need to have a day job, and that's OT and E. We need to be light and lean. We can't build this staff up like the 82nd Airborne into hundreds of people to do this mission. Light, lean, agile, still have a day job. We rely on the total force integration to do this. Guard and Reserve will form almost half of our core JTF staff. It'll be half from the 9th Air Force staff, and almost half is going to come from the ARC. And that's split pretty evenly between the Guard and the Reserve. Guards got 25, Reserve got 25, we got 60. So 50 ARC, 69th Air Force staff, 110 core. That's how we're going to move out the door if we get the call. 110 core. That two roles where it says supported and supporting is just a couple different ways you could use this capability. Um, the supporting piece, if something popped off in, say, Indo-PACOM, and they wanted a JTF, they could probably man that JTF right there in that COCOM. And they'll build up their own JTF with the resources and the personnel that they have. And they might say, hey, we need some comm folks, we need some planners, and 9th Air Force might come in and support their effort. We wouldn't lead it, but we'd support it. The other one is, hey, we're on the GERF, CENTCOM says they need a JTF, and they say, bring out your JTF, and you're leading the JTF, and we'll fill it out at that JMD later. So we could be the supported agency, or we could flow in and we could support some other JTFs. We have that capability, and we want to help. Increase our role in Air Force uh, Joint and United States Air Force uh, exercises. Ninth Air Force and NAFSA has been separated since 2009. That's not going to change. We get calls every week about something about AFSENT, and Ninth Air Force is not AFSENT anymore. We haven't been for a long time. That career path is uh, pretty important. Um, it says 06s, but it's really for any, anybody, right? It's the right place, the right airman, the right time, and the right job with the right training. 
to do this right and to do this well and to help us gain credibility in the joint community, you know, we really can't fill our directorates and our staff with uh, folks that are, hey, I just need a job because I'm going to retire here pretty soon. Those 06 billets, they get group commander credit. All right, these are some airmen that are on their way up. They got a, they got a fruitful future in our Air Force and they want to come in here and do that business. If we didn't have that, I don't know that we get the right airmen in the right place and right time with the right set of skills. So we're working on that development plan for our 06s and our enlisted folks. Expect personnel machine challenges. Yeah, we all do that, right? And let 9th Air Force chart the path for the Air Force. Um, we're not going to be the only JTF headquarters in the Air Force, I think, when this is all said and done. And as we move forward over the next two to five years or so, there are going to be some others. Some, some NAFs that I hear the most talked about are, well, one of them is 18th Air Force, is what I hear. Um, anybody else or anything? You've heard any other NAFs for JTF? Everybody know what the AFSIG is? Did you have a focus area discussion at some point um, during the week? So the Air Force Strategic Integration Group. This is a newsletter that came out in December 18, so not too long ago, a handful of months. I don't think you're going to see anything about the Chief Staff of the Air Force number two focus area where they're not going to mention the work that's going on in 9th Air Force. It is going to be part of that discussion, and this was in their newsletter. Timing from crisis to stand-up of JTF is about six weeks. Commanders chosen, headquarters and staff are assembled to go forward to design a campaign, integrated joint allied interagency teammates, and execute military operations. The force we need demands at that timeline be eliminated. That's why we need to have our JTF capabilities stood up at all times and ready at all times. Ready on day one of the crisis to go as a fully qualified team. Ninth Air Force is leading the way on this model. Future CNAS will be identified. Uh, I highlighted the CNAFs in red because some of the NAFs that we're talking about are not CNAFs. So it's not just CNAFs. Ninth Air Force expects to have the core JTF certified by December of 18, and we did that. We are at IOC now. What I want to mention here, too, is that we're not trying to replace anybody. We don't need the Army to think that, hey, the Air Force is trying to you know, take over our mission set. You know, we're the JTF leaders. Two MEB and the Marine Corps could say the same thing. Hey, that's, that's our job. That's what we do. What we're trying to do is offer just another arrow in the joint quiver. We are, we are giving another capability, another option to the Secretary of Defense when a mission comes up and they need a JTF. Hey, the Air Force has something to offer. And oh, by the way, we're going to be pretty good at that. Not taking anybody's job. Are there, there are maintenance chiefs in here, right? Some maintenance chiefs? Steve head nods. Yep, in the back there. Okay. How about uh, three papas? Are there any, any cops in here too? Okay. So I, got, I put pictures in my slide for you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if everything I just said, you know, didn't make sense, that was for you, John, too. Three papa add in there. I think maintenance and cops, you know, we're, we're like cousins. You know, we're pretty close. But, <laughs> but I got some pictures in here for some chiefs out there. Ninth Air Force prior to 2018. This is just an OT&E slide, right? We do organized training and equip. There's some mission sets in Ninth Air Force that we execute every single day. Then if you look at today, we've added these things. We didn't stop that, but we've added this. And what you see here is uh, some of our staffers kind of going over the battle rhythm and how a commander's battle rhythm, what that would look like across multiple time zones. And how B2C2WGs, board bureaus, center cells, working groups, and all those meetings feed a next meeting that feed the decision cycle for the commander. That is not easy to do, and I'm glad I don't have to do that. That is very hard. Over here, you'll see some A1 folks. They're at their machines, and they're doing joint reception, staging, onward movement, and integration, JRSO and I. That's what those folks over there are doing. This is uh, some joint uh, A4. Got a senior match sergeant there sitting next to his army brother getting after logistics. 
And then that's the JPRC over there. So we got some personnel rescue folks doing some exercises with us right there. And that's our, that's our tentage. That was our MRX. Is there any combat com group folks in here? No? That was only possible because of the 5th Combat Com Group down, in, down at Robbins that helped us out during our uh, mission readiness exercise that got us to IOC and qualified us in June. So we do both those things and it's pretty busy for our staff, for sure. So moving on to my second bullet, I said I was going to talk a little bit about the Joint Staff Basic Course that we do uh, right there at Shaw. And I'm going to give you my personal opinion. Now, I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I've been wrong before. But historically, how we filled out JMDs in the Air Force just wasn't up to Air Force standards. It just wasn't. If there was a JTF out there that needed 50 bodies of these grades by 1 January, maybe by 2 February, 37 bodies showed up with no training, and they might or might not have met that grade requirement. And that's, generally speaking, our history filling out JMDs in the United States Air Force. The AOC, we will fill that 100%. And we'll make sure that that organization is ready to rock and roll. But the joint staff, we just didn't do that as well as we could have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that training piece. I think we need to gain our great credibility back with the joint community. We need to fill our JMDs, and we really need to provide the right training for those airmen before they show up to work in that joint staff. And that's what this class is designed to do. So it's uh, taught by Air University. We got some instructors that come down uh, from here, come up to Shaw, and they teach a two to three week course. So right up here, this top bump, bumper sticker, targeted, tailored, joint training for airmen assigned to joint staffs. We started out with just CJTF OIR. So if you're going to go to Arif John, you're going to be part of that staff. And this started when you were still there, right, Chief Batten, probably around early 16 maybe, where you had your first course. If you were going to go there, you were going to come to Shaw, and you were going to go through a couple weeks of training before you headed out. We have recently opened that up. So if you're going to go to Afghanistan, if you're, you're going to be on the staff that works Operational Freedom Sentinel or Resolute Support in Afghanistan, you're going to come to Shaw and you're going to go through this staff training before you go. Okay, everybody's familiar with line remarks. It'll tell you whether or not you need to take the training. Um, it's really not AFSC specific. Now, if you, if you are going to be in these agencies right here, you might have to go to some other courses. You might have to go to a joint exercise or this JSJ7 training and tabletop, you might have to do that. What I'm really focused on is this piece right here, and that's the course at Shaw. And it's broad joint education. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. It is essential that we strengthen develop uh, development of airmen who are not only steeped in business of air power, but also knowledgeable in how we optimize every component as part of a joint task force. So, so the first week, those are the, the subject matter discussions that you're going to go through in that first week. And you'll see how it kind of builds on this little Lego block here. Creating joint staff headquarters capable airmen, forming the organi organizing concepts, joint functions, management processes, and application exercises. That's the second week right there. Um, Com rails are never easy. Anybody been deployed on a staff before downrange? Been assigned to the staff? I see a couple head nods. Command relationships are, are always difficult. They go through some of that. They go through all the steps of the joint operational uh, planning process. And uh, they get current intel, intelligence updates for the AOR that they're going to. And we will reach out and we'll get some leadership from that staff and they will VTC in with the class and they'll get a chance to communicate with them before they head downrange. Here's another huge benefit from that. Hey, the people that are in the class are the people they're probably going to be working with when they go down range, and they're already starting to network and team up a little bit before they head down there to do those jobs. Historically, you show up, you might get a left seat, right seat for a couple days, you might not, and, and 
oh, by the way, you're attached to a huge army, typically an army organization, and you're bolted on, and you're small, and you're one or two, you know what happens? You might get pushed to the fringes in some of those, some of those staffs. Um, so that networking, I think, is pretty important that they do at Shaw as well. Week two, they do some more intelligence operations, course of action process, and then they tabletop staff estimate op words. They write a frago, and we take op words from the operation that they're in, if it's Freedom Sentinel, Resolute Support, or OIR. We'll take that op board, and they'll write a frago. They'll give them a scenario, and then this, the class breaks up into pieces, and they write a frago. <clears throat> All right, any questions about the course? Because I'm about to move on on some snake charts on how we built the JTF headquarters over the last couple of years. Yeah, go ahead. How much has Arson been playing into this? Have they been trying to help out? I mean, it's kind of a huge benefit having them right there on the same patch with everybody. Have they kind of had any kind of intel saying, hey, this is what we expect you guys when you get there? Not with the JTF staff basic course, um, but we do use them when we exercise. Okay. Good question. Yeah, there's an opportunity there. We recognize, yeah, R sent right there on our patch, F sent on our patch too, and, and we do use them. Absolutely. Good question. It was very deliberate when we started that because we actually had people based upon the renovation of our building. We had them in R sent headquarters, but it was very deliberate to ensure that this was known that this is not an R sent class for us, the Army, to go in. It was, you know, it was a Ninth Air Force, Air Force. Group. So it was deliberate to keep it separate, but utilize. Army okay, this is uh, this is kind of past to present. All right, so I'm starting I'm starting here in October of 16 on this snake chart, and on this left hand side it says capability, and you kind of see our and you, you can see on this snake chart our path up until just a month or two ago, January 19. This kind of stops. We got our initial operational capability in December of last year. Chief, real quick on that. Yeah. Your IOC, what is that part of I got a slide for that. Okay. Right, so you need to hold on one second. I'll get to that. Good question. Um, Corona South decision briefing, 9th Air Force JTF headquarters COA approval, involving 9th Air Force and expeditionary JTF capable headquarters, right around here. We started our joint staff basic course around the start of the year in 17. We got authorization for some additional billets, so our staff did grow. Um, our staff at the end state will be about 91 folks or so, and right now we're in the 50s. So we have the billets, we just don't have the people, right? That's stuff that you live through all the time. You might have an authorization, but you don't have a body in there doing that job. That's kind of where we're at right now. But on the TFI piece, again, we use MPA days a lot on our staff to fill that gap and keep that capability. And we're in lean con trying to make this work on a shoestring budget. Um, and TFI is helping us out quite a bit. So JTF certification uh, plan approved. Had a SATAF July 17. I kind of want to talk about these just for a second. About once a quarter, we were doing a staff X to get some reps on forming a JTF and doing some planning. What you'll see here is UCOM, PACOM, US Forces Korea, and AFRICOM. We did real world scenarios every time we did a staff X. I can even come up here and uh, our MRX too was, uh, that was a CENTCOM scenario and we were working against malign Russian influence in, in uh, Afghanistan. That was our task. Build a JTF, counter malign Russian influence in Afghanistan. That's a tough job right there. Um, so these are real world. We didn't do unicorn land, invaded fairy land, and this is what our JTF headquarters was gonna do. You know, we tried to use real scenarios and even you know, our products and our output, we offered those to, those to the leadership of those COCOMs so they could take a look at that. Maybe there's something in there that they could use. You know, free chicken, got some planters together. We thought through some problems. Here's our products. 
Some of you are probably wondering what this dip is right there. Anybody got an idea? The time might help a little bit. What happens in the summer? Swap out. I heard some say swap out. Every single director, one to eight, left us. Right there. They all left. So all these exercises, we kind of built up our capability here. And then everybody swapped out in July. We had our MRX in January, and man, we needed to giddy up right here. So did a Southcom, Centcom. We trained with the Jack. Anybody know what the Jack is? Anybody in AMC? Used to be in AMC? Joint Expeditionary uh, Capabilities Command. A joint Enabling Capabilities Command, excuse me. Um, that's a, they're, they're a JTF. I mean, they're joint. This is what they do, and they've helped us out quite a bit to help spin up Ninth Air Force. And that was our MRX in, in, in December. Ninth Air Force declare IOC as a JTF headquarters following a certification events that demonstrates Ninth Air Force staff, ARC line personnel, capability, capacity to plan, prepare, execute, and assess JTF operations in unified action to operational level of military activities. So that's where we're at today. I got an FOC slide coming here in a second. Yeah, go ahead. So I don't know what a CRW does as much as I know what a JTF might do, but my limited knowledge on a CRW is um, they can do airfield authority, they got a mark, they got maintenance, they've got port, and they've got security, right? Yep, we're above, we're a level above that. JTF is not going to be run by a CRW. A CRW is going to support a JTF, so that's really the biggest piece. You know what I mean? I, I would say. Yep, you're right. Okay. Good question. No bad questions. Because a CRW again is what? Air Force, right? So that will fall into a joint task force, which is pulling in all the services with whatever the unique capabilities that we need from those services. That capability that would be coming from the CRW would be focused on those things that we need from that. Versus would be pulling in whatever army, whatever marines to do those those pieces of the uh, logistics or whatever else. Piece. Yeah, if we wanted to kind of think through uh, using the PACOM scenario, you know, their staff might form a JTF and the, the two-star general, the CG that's in charge of it, might come from the PACOM staff, and then you'd see the JEC roll in with their team and they'd start off this JTF and they'd form with that, that COCOM staff. The CRW might show up right around that time and support that as well. And then 9th Air Force might flow in and take over if they needed us to at a later time. But the CRW, like he said, would support the JTF. What I wanted to show here is when we, were, we had our MRX that, yeah, we had a lot of Air Force units there, but you, you look at the numbers, it kind of small from each organization. But good Air Force representation. Um, we had the Army there with us. There's our scent. There's some our scent synergy right there. One. Well, we had them with us. Bragg, 82nd Airborne. Uh, Jack, as I, I talked about a minute ago, we had some uh, sailors there with us. The 2nd uh, Marine Expeditionary Force had some folks there with us. Um, the J7 was there. And then we have. Uh, we had some coalition with us too. So the Brits have a standing joint task force there and, and, and their air force. And we had a handful of them with us. And we have a, we have a wing commander on our staff full time, ninth air force. So you can see all the three letter agencies that came out and supported us. And these are like ACPs and senior mentors that came out to, to and they were really valuable to the operation. Let us know what we needed to work on a big long list of folks that were senior mentors for both myself and my boss as we went through that exercise. So very joint and other go governmental or, uh, agencies and so on. So to get at your question, you know, our March to FOC, what does it mean when we're FOC? This is how we're defining it. FOC is a JTF cable headquarters. We have 90% of the people that we need 
and we have all of the required mission critical, critical equipment. And I'll talk through that a little bit here on this snake chart, exactly what that is. Um, that'll give us the capability and the capacity to plan, prepare, execute, and assess JTF operations. So again, same kind of chart, capability. Now we're starting January 19, and we're going to move all the way out to January of 21. Um, FOC will probably be around uh, December. That actually, excuse me, that 21 is a mistake. That's 20. Or no, that is January 21. It's December of 20 when we'll have, we plan to have BFOC. Excuse me. So we have the C2 Summit out at WebTAC. Um, in this spring, we're going to be doing a blue flag exercise with AF South. Uh, Pacific Century following that. This again, you know, not as drastic a dip, but we're going to swap out some directors again and we're going to have to constantly spin up. That's life in the Air Force, right? Um, ACC force optimization, we might be doing some changes and we might have to refocus on how we organize, organize a little bit there. So that's part of that dip. Um, so this FCP stands for flexible comm package. We got some comm folks in here? Yeah. Okay, you probably know more about this. I, I learned the term enclave. You know, I, I got the system. I can have three different enclaves. I can have Nipper, Sipper, uh, JWIX, BICES, those kinds of things for coalition forces, right? So flexible comp package is just the way we communicate and the way we do C2. We got to have that capability. In fact, we need two of them, one that we can exercise with and one in, in war reserve. And if we really needed to get out of town, you know, we pick that kid up and we just go. So that's... That's comm equipment, that's tents, that's, you know, screens, um, phones, computers, chairs, signage, paper, printers, all those things. When I say flexible comm package, I'm talking about that whole tent setup that you saw in one of those pictures. So, um... How long is the tenure? Well, you saw my previous slide last summer, we lost our directors and then we're doing it again the next year, right? So yeah. So I think the plan is for these folks to go down range for a year, right? So they're gonna go down, they're gonna work on a staff. They're gonna real world execute all the training that they've, that they've received in Ninth Air Force. They're gonna take that to a staff and they're gonna water the joint community's eyes with their skills and their abilities. And then we're going to bring some of those folks back to Shaw to continue that. <clears throat> um, C2 Summit comes up again at, uh, at Nellis in, is that, is that timing right? January, February? Northern Viking is an exercise that we'll do with uh, some coalition partners, mainly Iceland. And that'll be our, really our certification event for FOC. That's where we'll really command and control forces. We're going to be out there with the joint and coalition community exercising a real world scenario and again controlling forces. That's us getting reps. Summer PCS cycle again. Pad and P plan complete. We've got all of our flexible comp package stuff here. Our TFI manpower, again, it's really important that we have habitual relationships with our total force partners and they can flow into our staff and that we've trained together and then come December our plan is to be JTF headquarters capable in December of 2020. Not related to what? Nope. Nope. Like we have DDFs in our world, probably tailor made for what you need. Are you guys able to? Yeah. Yep. We set one of those up during our MRX. And we were able to go up to uh, TSSEI. Love it. I that. recommend Camo Netting or the temperature stop plan. Yeah. Like Camo Netting. Good. That's good. Yeah, we just recently got some folks. When we set that up, we really didn't have. Um, I didn't grasp how difficult it is to set up a, a DDF somewhere on Shaw proper. But um, to have TSSEI and the requirements and cameras and access and 
Um, do we have a direct line to the B dock on the base? I, we had actually we had airmen sleeping in that overnight. But we do have some we have some experts now in comm, intel, and security that are on our staff right now, and they're going to help us nug through all those things. Um, we also had the joint communication uh, support element JCSE is part of the JEC. Um, they're really good at what they do, and they they gave us a lot of information too. So fifth combat comm group, um, JCSE, and some of our staff, we're kind of moving along on that making some good progress. I'll just encourage uh, these two gentlemen right here have a lot of DDS experience. Reach out to them. They've got some lessons learned that maybe didn't get documented that could save you guys some time and provide more comfort to you. Yeah, okay. Thanks to you for pointing out those two other guys. You know, because because I'm going to have to, I'll be looking for you guys on break, you know. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, future considerations, you know, um, really the top three Main bullets there are 9th Air Force, Major General Zobris and myself telling ACC, hey, we're doing this on a shoestring budget, and um, eventually we're going to have to get resources the way we need to be to keep this moving along. Um, if I'm talking about a bunch of comm equipment, that means people, right? I mean, people have to maintain that, so we need additional builds for the 5th Combat Comm Group. Um, TFI is not going to move forward. We're, you know, we're not going to be able to exercise with them, identify those people, um, build those relationships until we've got money to put towards those positions and bring them on active duty. So uh, training and resources, ARC mandates I mentioned, exercise funds, palming in FY21, keeping our software procurement and refurbishment of buildings on path, on a good glide path, and then we had a SATAF at Shaw, actually. They might still be there now, but they showed up this week to take a look at what we might need as we move forward towards December 20, FY21. I underline these two right here because I think when I said earlier about the small part that everybody in this room kind of plays in this JTF are really these two bullets here. You know, the Air Force culture and... and Experience limitations and sister service perceptions and building credibility. You know, I fully expect to be the fat kid at the punch bowl, you know, waiting, waiting to dance. You know, I'm tapping my foot and I'm at the punch bowl and I'm just waiting to get out there on the dance floor. That's going to be Ninth Air Force JTF when we start off. But when we get asked to dance, we got to be like Kevin Bacon out there, <laughs> right? We got to cut loose. And we got to be good at our business. We might be the JTF dog walkers, you know, for a year or two. But our hope is, as, as we get out in the joint community and we're exercising with our partners, you know, maybe some naysayers will eventually be sitting in a room, in the back of a room, and they go, who's on the GERF, 9th Air Force? And they go, oh, I don't know if this is the right mission for 9th Air Force. And there's a guy in the back of the room that knows about us and worked with us and said, hey, you know what? I was at Northern Viking with those guys and gals. They're pretty good. And then maybe we'll get out there on the dance floor and we'll shake loose, right? So uh, everybody can help with the perceptions and the culture. You know, um, someone mentioned the R sense close to us, right? And there's some capability there. Are we fully taking advantage of every opportunity for jointness? If you read the AFSIG newsletter and you talk about strengthening joint teams and leaders and you read about Ninth Air Force and what they're doing, do you go, that's great, 9th Air Force is doing some joint stuff. That's good. That's how the Air Force is doing joint stuff. Or do you read that and go, can I do something? Can we do something? Maybe there's an Army organization down the road. You know, maybe you got some Marines on your patch. Maybe you can send some airmen to a Lance Corporal's course. You know, something like that. I was downrange in 332nd Air Expeditionary Wing for a year. And um, on a couple of our bases, we had Army. And we had Marines, too, out at Al Jabber. And when I went, I was like, hey, how are, we, how are we integrating and learning from each other? Is there anything that we're doing to become more joint today? Are we going to wait for the JTF at headquarters, 9th Air Force? Or are we going to make our airmen joint today? There, I think there are a lot of opportunities out there. And if we just look for them, take advantage of them. There are things that a lot of you probably could do to speed up the jointness of your airmen. 
again, perceptions and building credibility. That's what we're trying to do. We're getting out there. And we've been to most COCOMs, my boss and I, and uh, we're offering free chicken. We're like, hey, we're free chicken. You got some exercises coming up in your COCOM? We want to come out. We want reps. We want to build our capability. We want to be credible in the joint community. We'll spend the money. We're going to come up there and we'll help you out. And you know what? They want us. They do. We thought maybe there'd be some, hey, we're good. We're good. And they're like, no. Every senior leader we talk to, you're like, we'll take it. We like free chicken. What do you think? I'm doing pretty good. Any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. The JTS not. It sounds like a presentation of forces kind of kind of question. Chief Batten, can I phone a friend on this one? You got any yeah, intel I don't on that have one? Have an update on a transition plan for EMEDS or how we're looking to better align it. I can get with General Friedrich over at SG, but he's right. That the JTS again. That would be kind of like I say with the CRW. That would be a capability that is presented in the JTS. How we organize, train, and equip those to then be There, okay. is, there is, but it's it's a lot more focused on what's going on with the DHA and how we're going to maintain that readiness piece of our medical personnel as well as our force. So it's on that side more than it's on this side, you know what I mean, is, is what our discussion is. Yeah, that's a good question, and, and sounds like he'll take a look at that. You know, our answer in a JTF might be the comfort, you know, might be the hope, you yeah, know. I mean, we, we support a resilient <clears throat> Yeah. We understand how those assets work. Just from curiosity, the JTS. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Hey, thanks for your time. Again, you might have airmen that have been to Shaw and went through that course. You know, so it might touch some of your airmen. Maybe you haven't gone, but they might go to that course and not ask them, hey, what do you think? What did you learn? Maybe you could bring some of that back to some other airmen in the organization and talk a little bit about what you saw at the Joint Staff Basic Course. Again, there might be opportunities on your base. And I just ask you to th put some thought into that and can we build joint airmen on your base? And, and I'll close with this last comment here. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to build joint knowledge and joint experience. And, and when I stand up in front, and oh, by the way, every Joint Staff Basic Course my boss and I, we're getting the frago briefs from the team. So we're, we're invested in this course. It's not something that happens over here on the peripherals. We're going to a number of events as that course is going on. Because my boss used to be the deputy CFAC, and he's got a lot of experience in the, in the joint world in that position. So he brings a lot to the course. Um, but I tell the students when I'm talking to them that, hey, think about this. You know, there might be an airman out there that knows all the ranks and all the services. And then if you look at their joint experiences and the time they've been on some staffs, you know, it might total up to six, seven years. And we look at that person, we go, man, that's really someone steeped in joint and is an expert in joint. And maybe they are. Or you might have an airman that actually has none of that time, but we've grown that airman to be a professional airman and they don't care about who gets the credit. They don't look at someone across the table and I want the Air Force to do this, you know, and get the credit for this. They're just a good teammate. And they just are mission focused. And they have these 
characteristics of leadership. I know my business. I'm an expert in my business. I don't care who gets the credit. I'm going to come together as a team, and we're going to execute the mission, and we're going to win. I'd say that airman is very joint, or they're prepared to succeed in a joint community. If that other airman is all worried about who gets the credit, and I'm going to fight, and I'm not a very good teammate, and there's only one way to do it, and then I'm going to strike a target with only Air Force assets, I would tell you that that airman is probably less joint than that brand new airman that just comes in and says, I want to be part of the team and I want to execute the mission and I'm going to stay mission focused and I'm going to be open to new ideas and new things and I'm going to learn in this job. If you're that airman, you're joint in my mind because joint is not time, it's not experience, it's attitude. Joint is attitude. And I don't need you to spend time with a soldier to be joint. I need you to be a damn good airman. If you're a good airman, guess what? I think that's going to translate to joint pretty smoothly. Again, that, that's another chief weight opinion. Yeah, so Over to you, bud. chat for a few minutes about the purpose of this, you know, and, and I share, it's not just Chief Wade's opinion there, it's my opinion. So the purpose of this was to let you know that there are things that we're doing within ACC, within our Air Force, to develop people, to be prepared to go and work in a joint environment, whether that's a standing, uh, ongoing operations at a Sajida or a Jayata or something out there in the world going on right now, or if it's future to where we're going to have our own capability within the Air Force to be able to do that, we're going to work in a joint you, hear, you heard some of the discussion yesterday with regard to developing joint leaders, and you hear it quite often. I hear, like, what are we going to do, right? What are we going to put into our PME? What, what training am I going to get to be a joint leader? And I, I, I go to, like, what Dave just said. I mean, what, what do I need you to know about being a joint leader? I don't need you, because many of the joint environments you go into, right, joint is spelled A-R-M-Y. <laughs> Why is it spe spelled A-R-M-Y? Well, because for many years, we never filled our JMD positions, right? And if we're going to go, go with the 10th Mountain Division somewhere, right, and we only fill 37 of our 50 positions, get, guess what they're going to do? They're going to fill the other 13 positions with their soldiers because they need them filled. So that's why these have been predominantly large Army organizations when you go into them. But I do not need you to come out of a deployment or to come out of one of these things saying hua every other word, man. I'm, that's not why. We didn't send you to a joint environment to speak Army. They needed you to come in there and speak Air Force, right? And be a great player in the position you play, right? You can't go on a team, right? My favorite team, right? The New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't build a New England Patriots, right? With just a bunch of crappy players, right? You just can't do it. You can't pull in a bunch of crappy people that don't really know how to do their own job, right? You have to pull people into your team that know how to perform in their position. And then you have an organization that can bring those great position players into working as a team. That's what a team's about. But we have this mindset in our, in our world, in our Air Force, you know, that we, we need more joint training. We need somebody to teach me how to be joint. We need no... We need to continue doing the things we do. We need to get better at some of the ways that we're doing it. And we're doing pretty darn good about presenting our forces to the joint environment. Uh, one, I think we have service energy, to be honest. Uh, I'm sorry, I got my notes on my, my, my key. You know, this is what happens when you go into a briefing and you're listening, and you're like, damn it, I should have brought my notebook in here, because there's things to write down. I hope you guys have been writing it down. Where our problem is, I think, in joint integration, where we lack in joint integration, but it's OK is not the joint organization and the joint interaction, uh, per se, on us being the position players and us being able to integrate with the team. Where sometimes we get frustrated is the joint systems, right? So you go in and you start operating now in an Army system or a Marine system of operations, right? You're on a different battle rhythm. That's what takes a little bit to spin up. But when you're talking about developing joint leaders, I'm telling you, it, it's all about you being good at what you do, not being good at being able to say hua, you know what I mean, or another <laughs> term. Where I'll tell you, to, so service envy, right? And, and this is still part of joints. So deliberate development, let me start with that first. Deliberate development to be joint leaders, right? People say, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't even talk about that with our higher tenures, right? Oh, we can't compete for these joint jobs because we're going up against these sergeant majors that have all this time, or we can't do this. What are we talking about? 
And we're sitting at Stratcom, we're sitting at Transcom, we're sitting at Africom, we're getting ready to sit at UCOM, we're sitting at DISA, we're sitting at DITRA, we're sitting at NRO. Our chief master sergeants compete very well for combatant commands and joint jobs because they are great leaders that we've developed. Some will say, well, it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't deliberate to develop, you know, somebody like a, a Jay France to be the transcom guy. He came from AFMC. It wasn't deliberate. What is deliberate about a lot of these positions? There was no deliberate in development to where there was a track that somebody said, Frank Patton's going to be the ACC command chief. Shoot, I almost retired three times along this path. <laughs> Just based upon running out of room and what was next. It's like, oh, crap, I guess I'm retired. But there was a deliberate piece to the fact that they kept giving me an opportunity to grow myself and become a better leader and to get a broader sense of things to prepare me for the ability to take on this position. That's the same as deliberate development. Deliberate development, in my mind, doesn't mean that I'm preparing Dave Wade to be the next CENTCOM person. I'm preparing Dave Wade to be able to handle the things he needs to handle in his world right now and prepared to go to the next level and operate in that environment. But we do this quite a bit in our service. We sit here and say, man, you know, the Army has such a better fitness program than us. Or the, the Army, you know, why can't we go like the Marines? The Marines have two tracks. Why can't I go and be a Master Gunnery Sergeant and stay functionally aligned or go be a Sergeant Major and be command aligned? Just like the Army does it. Why can't we do this in our Air Force, man? They've got such a great program. Good Lord. What do we have in ours? Oh, that's right. We have a way that you can go be a squadron superintendent, which is a functioning line job. You can go be a group superintendent, which is, for the most part, a functioning line job. And then you can go be a career field manager, which is a functioning line job. Or you can go over here and kind of do the same and go be a command chief. Oh, and what happened? Oh, wait a minute. You were a wing command chief, and then the career field manager spot opened up, and you're the most qualified person? Here, let me step back across this line that I can't do in another service and go back into my functional community and perform there with the knowledge I had here. Or step from this over to here. I'm telling you, we have to stop thinking about our service as something that it's not as great as what it is in this joint community. We are very well prepared to lead in those environments. You all know it. You've been in those environments. I spent a year in Afghanistan, and I'll tell you what they love. They loved us. They loved the fact that they could bring in any of our airmen, any of our NCOs, any of our senior NCOs onto their team, and within about a week, they had integrated in that team and were performing at a higher level than their soldiers. We had staff sergeants in Afghanistan teaching Army logistics to the Afghan Army better than the Army logistician could teach his own course, right? And they work in different things with their categories of, of, uh, of, of supplies. So. That was the point of bringing this, right, is to let you know that we're doing things within our Air Force. We're getting after the joint uh, uh, concepts, and we've developed this joint task force to be able to go forward and in the future be a presentable force uh, for, for those senior leaders in our, in our uh, uh, country to present forces and get after things that we need to get after. Any questions or comments on my soapbox there? I tell you, man, I love this Air Force. We, we have it right. I mean, I've had a chance to work with the other services. I'm not saying they don't have it right, but we have it pretty damn right. You know what I mean? If you talk to those that have had a little bit more time in the joint environment, they'll tell you the same things. There's definitely things we can learn from one another. I think we need to continue learning it, and, and we'll do that. Why don't we go ahead and take another break? Let's just do like a, oh, let's do like 10 minutes this time, a little bit more than 10 minutes. Force optimization, how we present the forces. Uh, one of the ones that is going forward, Actually, my boss and much of the 24th, 25th leadership was together this week in San Antonio while I was here with you all. Uh, I don't know which is a better balance of my time, but I enjoyed this week with you all, and I'll get a back brief from them on what went on, but we were doing more of a tabletop exercise and kind of running through some of the drills and how we're going to pull the 24th and 25th Air Force together. Roughly in the July time frame is what we're looking at doing. Uh, the number one rule on all these changes our number one goal is to do no harm, right, as far as to the missions and the things that we do. There were many different codes that we were exploring about keeping them separate, maybe taking some from one and putting it in the other, and taking some from one and putting it in another now. But the bottom line decision was made, hey, we're going to put these two together. Uh, there is several concerns with regard to those organizations, as you can imagine. There's a lot of authorities that are based inside of those, both on the cyber side and on the intel side, on the cryptological side, and ensuring that that one person that's wearing those 15 different hats now, and the developmental tracks, 
for both the, the Intel, Cyber, and there's a flying piece in that also because we have large wing ISR. I'm sorry, I just started early. I, I apologize. You guys are late. Uh, I'm talking about pulling the 24th and 25th Air Force together, and, and the timeline is this summer. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we are working on this week to look out for, the, you know, as far as how our command structure will be, what the staff will be, and the organization inside of it. Uh, there's also discussions on whether or not inside of those we have uh, uh, a task force like uh, with regard to uh, cyber, with regard to detail, with regard to the electromagnetic spectrum, and then that also could provide an opportunity uh, for growth on those, uh, uh, mainly on the officer side as far as what they're looking on the track, but also on the enlisted side uh, on how we grow those things, cyber, intel, and uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, leaders and operating those domains. Some of the changes that you'll see is some of it will maybe cross lines across the wings. There's some of the intel side that's better suited in some of the cyber wings that are already operating together uh, at many of our NSA locations. There's other pieces to it, like the fifth combat com that you can see maybe coming out of that organization and slipping over to the 9th Air Force. Uh, and I'll talk about the force optimization piece of the 9th Air Force. But, so that's kind of what we're looking at, and that is moving forward, and it's going to be a fast-paced uh, uh, thing. But again, do no harm is what the goal is, because we still have to provide the same capabilities to those uh, uh, COCOMs and agencies that we're provided to right now. So we'll, we'll continue to move out in that direction. With regard to the other NAV, so First Air Force will pretty much remain unchanged. This is the discussion right there. Warfare Center will pretty much remain unchanged. There was a talk about whether or not we should move the 505th over to 9th Air Force as a command and control kind of a NAV. That wasn't what we decided to do. There is some internal reorganization uh, within those wings in, in the Warfare Center has been discussed, but the third wing has some initiatives and so does the 505th, so they'll work that. With the 9th and 12th, so you heard the term CNAP earlier. I don't know if you realize that it's CNAP, a component NAP, right? And that's what I was meaning when I was saying how we project forces or, or, uh, or interact with the combat commands. You know, Third Air Force is the you, you know is the CNAP to UCOM, uh, um, and you know our CNAP to F South is the 12th Air Force. Ninth Air Force used to be a C CNAP when it was Ninth Air Force slash absent because absent was the component piece of the NAP. We split that back in 2009, and yes, the whole time I was in the Ninth Air Force, everybody kept saying, hey, how often do you get down range? I don't. Absent isn't us anymore. It hasn't been for many years. So in this Ninth Air Force, 12th Air Force construct, John will tell you, they spend probably about 80% of their time, and the majority of their staff is staffed for the AF South component <coughs> piece. It doesn't mean that they're not doing a good job of doing the organized training equip for the wings that are assigned under the 12th Air Force. We feel, though, that there would be better uh, synergy in organizing training and training those forces to have them in the one NAV. So shifting all of those wings to the 9th Air Force, and then AF South would be 12th Air Force AF South, and their focus would strictly be on their component piece, much the same that AF said it is. And then those wings would align inside of 9th Air Force, so they would basically have all the combat air forces in them as kind of a force provider as, long, as well as our personnel uh, uh, personnel rescue, uh, uh, personal recovery, why don't I keep saying personal rescue, personal recovery. And then there's another wing that we're looking at uh, standing up in there. It's again, these are all bills that have to be paid. We have to find the manpower for that. But an agile combat support type of wing, a little bit different than the CRW question that came up. This is more where we could take our red horses we could take our 820th BDG, we could take our 5th Combat Com. Uh, there's even discussion with, you know, can we go to AFMC and maybe steal their bear base? You know what I mean? And I'd say steal, you know, but you know, it would be more aligned to have that to where we have an expeditionary style of a wing that can provide those same type of functions to go maybe even align with our JTF as the support piece for that. Another one that stands out in my mind is even the 53rd Air Traffic Control Squadron out at uh, uh, Robbins, it falls underneath the 461st, which really seems a little bit off because they used to be a fifth combat comp, and they're not the same as a J-Star mission, but they go forward and they, they open up a, a tower operation, air, air traffic control operations in four locations. So that's some of the things that we're doing on that piece as far as the NAP. Uh, there's some other initiatives that we've taken at a lower level with the wings. 
is what G Storm's going to talk to you a little bit about where we're where we were and where we're at with Mountain Home. There was multiple Magcom commanders that wanted to try similar things within their Magcoms. It was brief uh, to uh, the chief and the secretary during the Corona, and they gave us the okay to do one. Right, and after some meetings that we had with the secretary, not just to do one, but to actually use a control measure and actually figure out, hey, how can we see if this works or not, right? So right now, the 12, inside of the 12, we're doing this in 366. Our, our comparison is the fourth fighter wing. They're pretty close as far as what they are, one wing, one boss type of thing, same aircraft. Uh, there is an FTU piece on the Seymour Johnson piece, but uh, we also have uh, the Singapore uh, up, up at Mountain Home. So there's a little bit of the same, so we can, in the years to follow, we can kind of look and see how this goes. We've got two years to do this experiment. We're not quite a year into it, and we'll go through and we'll measure that. The premise and how we want to do these uh, wing organizations and even what we're doing with the NASA is really to push authorities and decentralize, like I said, the beginning to give squadron commanders uh, the ability to control what they're doing within their resources. It also gets after a little bit of a manpower piece. Uh, People say, well, what about the group commanders? What about the group chiefs? How do we develop the main chiefs if we take away groups? That's what we'll get in the years. It's really removing the groups to go with some deputy commanders. There is, if you look at year groups on the officers, there is some year groups in the in the future years where we're going to have some troughs with regard to 06s based upon where we're at with year groups. There's also, I know there were some head shakes for maintenance guys in here earlier. Maintenance group commanders typically do two maintenance group tours. Why? Because we don't have enough of them to have them do one and then go do staff time. We're one of the only uh, services too that has 206 command levels. So we have a person do a group command and do a wing command. Instead of in our other service, they'll do their command at that 06 level and then they'll go work in a joint staff or something, build the credibility, build those linkages and then go back and then work the one star level and then go back, you know what I mean? So it gives other possibilities. On the command chief side, uh, it's been asked to me, and I've worked with, my, with both my peers in the AFSELF as well as on, across our command. I don't see that we're going to lose anything on the developmental opportunities uh, for chiefs if we didn't have a group chief in, in an organization uh, in the initial phases. Why do I say that? Well, right now, as a command chief at a wing, right, I normally deal with who? I deal with my group superintendents. Right? Well, now, if I'm a command chief and I don't have group superintendents, who am I dealing with on a daily basis? I'm working. I'm, I'm developing. I'm working with those squadron chiefs and bringing them further along. There's also some pieces in the organization here, which gives a, a squadron chief a little bit more breadth and a little bit more experience across just their own mission set. And then there's key positions within their A staff that we can put a chief mass sergeant and develop them in that way. Currently. My rough numbers on the last candidate list for command chiefs, about 60% of those that were on the candidate list had served in some capacity at a group level. The ones that hadn't that are on the list served what? First sergeant, staff assignments, things like that. So that's why all of us that are sitting, it's about 70% of us have had some sort of a group experience. But to tell you what, looking at somebody's record and seeing their group chief is, it's kind of like a, I don't know if this number's a word I'm looking for, but so look at my records, right? Don't base, please don't. Man, I, I'm gonna be like Chief Patton, I'm gonna, he did it so I can do it, right? I got hired to be a group chief as a senior master sergeant. Because I was at Misawa, just like you all, I found out I'm a chief. I'm gonna be the, the overage, and uh, the ops group has a maintenance guy as his chief right now. He's leaving in May, he looks over and says, hey, I wanna hire this guy to be my next ops group. At the time, they did whatever the waiver was required. I didn't have a time and grade thing or anything like that. I actually sat in that seat for four months as a senior master sergeant. It was an officer group chief. And then 14 months later, what was I? I was the command chief for the 23rd wing. 14 months after sewing on chief, not 14 months after taking an officer group job. So they'll say, ah, oh, that guy was an ops group experience. You know, he's a group chief experience, so he was definitely prepared to be the 23rd wing command. I was not prepared to be the 23rd commander because I was a group chief for a year and a half. Man, that was a tough job. It was a steep learning curve. But I had been prepared, like I said earlier, for opportunities in the way I grew up to where I could lead at the level I needed to lead. But then I did two years of that at that wing. I did another year. I did another year at a wing. I did two years as an app. And I kind of baked in other areas. There's people out there that don't have group experiences, my point. 
but they've been a squadron chief for three years, or they were up at an A staff for a year, and then they did a squadron chief, for two. or they were first sergeant for three years, and they worked at some position. They did, you know what I mean? So if we just blanket say this stuff, I, I'm not concerned about the development of chiefs in these organizations and how we'll uh, uh, have a palette of uh, qualified individuals to serve in command roles in the future. A couple other areas that we're doing similar things in Mountain Home, and then I'll get off the stage and let Chief Storms talk through this one, is the 20th Fighter Wing down at Shaw has also done some stuff inside of their maintenance group. I think there, there's a little bit of it in the mission support group, but more the maintenance group where they've decentralized some of the things like phase, scheduling, uh, to get after, although we can't do an organizational change, we can get after the thing of spreading out these uh, resources and putting it back into the commander's hands to be able to, uh, to get after it. Group positions even down range we've looked at. So sometimes we get uh, pinched by uh, the force management levels, FML, how many boots on the ground you can have in Afghanistan. So as we're going through some drills in the future, they're looking at Bagram to cutting down the amount of groups they have. So if you're not familiar with the normal, with the current uh, force structure of Bagram and Kandahar, you know, Kandahar at one point was a wing. It stood down to it be an AEG. It still is currently an AEG. So Bagram is going to go to one group, but Bagram also is an AEG, not have a mission support, and not have a MXG, not have an OG. They'll still have a medical group based upon the role three there. But that MXG, MSG, and OG will now be an AEG. So the wing commander will have an AEG at Bagram and have an AEG at, uh, at Kandahar. And that's another way that we're kind of decentralizing a little bit and pushing things more down to the commanders. With the intent that in future fights, right, we need leaders that are that can be autonomous at times, right? You've already given them uh, command direction and intent. Now we're disaggregated or, or not able to communicate based upon you know the lack of maybe agile, flexible comms, and they can make decisions and go forth and do the things we need them to do, uh, and not be relying upon. I better ask my crew commander before I go and do this. So that's kind of a little bit of the premise. Uh, before we get into this brief. What I'll do is I'll turn it over to Chief Storm so he can kind of walk you through that. And then I'll come back after so that we can talk any questions that you all may have about what I just told you going on with the NAFs. And, uh, but we'll keep moving and then we'll we'll try and break it no later than 11.40 so that we can uh, get out there and get our first choice of the John Storms, I'm the Command Chief at 12th Air Force Staff South. Uh, obviously in our role as the, the NAF at 12th, uh, the 366 falls under us. And I'm going to throw this out there right now. I'm not an expert in this reorganization reorg experiment. There are four folks sitting in the auditorium here that are living this every day, and I'm going to lean heavily on their opinions and their experiences with this briefly. So if you have questions, by all means throw them out. And if I have a funny look on my face, I'm going to look at one of them, and hopefully they can answer for us, OK? All right, uh, things we're going to talk about. Uh, why are we trying this experiment? Uh, you can see up there the eye chart, some uh, increased readiness, uh, some issues with the medical community being able to support all of the folks that are being seen in the clinics on a daily basis, uh, stifled squadrons. Uh, Frank just touched on that with uh, you know that, that extra layer of the, the group in between the, the wing commander and the squadron commanders, and then just the ability to continue developing joint leaders. Uh, this is not new. You see this thing back from when uh, General Creature was commander of attack, uh, merging ops and maintenance. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, in our lifetime, Dave, right, we've done this before. This is nothing new, right? Ops and maintenance together. Uh, but I think you'll see there's some, some differences from now versus how we used to do it back in the day. Former wing structure, you see everybody's aligned under a group, it's functionally aligned. And then a lot of the staff burns are, are put at the group level and then the squadron level as well. I think you'll see with this, this new uh, organization, most of those, those staff requirements are removed from the squadrons that can function on the mission itself. Uh, here's, here's the wing structure as it sits right now up at Mountain Home. Obviously you've got the, the wing commander and command chief sitting up top. You've got a deputy commander for ops and a deputy commander for maintenance. Okay, both those sixes, you have certain generals in those six. Chief of Staff is in 06, you have your A staff, very much like ACC has on their staff. And then you have all the squadrons, 
reporting directly to the wing commander vice running through a wing, or through the group, excuse me. Does that make sense? The deputy commander for support is with you. Is that what I said? <coughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so yes. I'm sorry. Option support. <laughs> You can see some of the personnel changes, the numbers inactivated a couple of units there, plus up in some, uh, reduced in others. Say again? The whole wing? Yeah. Yeah. That's a valid question. I think it's it's in the four to five thousand. What's that? Forty five hundred? Forty five hundred. Forty five hundred. So I'm pretty right now. Four. Okay, so, so uh, hitting one of the chief's big rocks, right, revitalizing squadrons. You can see some of the uh, functions and <coughs> authorities that, that used to be held at various levels, what they've done with them. You know, they, you know, they've given them to uh, different levels of command. You see 190 of them went to garbage, which is probably a good thing, making us a little bit more efficient, eliminating some staff work. Uh, let me ask the folks that are actually up there in the wing, do you, do you feel that? Or do you feel like we're more efficient getting rid of some of these things or not? Or is it just looking at the PowerPoint? Could you state your career field when you talk about where you're at? Yeah. I'm sorry? Can you state your career field? What do you do there so that we can have a reference? Uh, I'm contracting over at Mountain Hill. I'm in the OSS spherical management. Um, I think it's different to. Based on the unit that, that you're in, um, we're all going to feel this a little bit differently right now, and it's it's still forming, so we're even losing some AFE is reorging, and some other sections are still, so it's, it's still very fresh in its infancy, uh, whereas some things have went down to the squadron commander, and some things uh, now, you know, we have to send up to DCOM O or DCOM S versus the group. Uh, so it's, it's definitely checking, I think we should go to the squadron. So why did this say so this looks like we just put 350 things into a squadron commander's lap now to do right? This is kind of what it looks like. There was 910 that were authorities at the group and now we grip it. But what that is, is these are things they were already doing that then they had to ask the group for permission to do, right? So then what we've said is no, you get to say yes or no on this. It could be as simple as, you know, we've had to work some A1 things. Maybe it's that MSM, right? that had to be signed at 06 level that now can be signed. Maybe it's, there's other things that now you can do it. And then the things that you don't need to be doing, we're gonna take that out of your hand. We're gonna give, give it to our A staff. So you don't focus on this. And we didn't want to overburden this wing commander either, right? To give him every bit of everything that all of the groups did. So that's kind of what it was. So it wasn't an addition of stuff. It was basically, you used to create a, a package to staff up to a group commander or a wing commander to say, hey, can we do this? Now they say, Squadron Commander, you have the authority. Go forth and conquer. Are there any maintenance chiefs here that are part of this? So I'm in the maintenance field of it right now, um, and there are, as I said, this infancy. We're still learning, we're still trying to ask questions, trying to get some kind of development of what this process is supposed to look like when it is green, right? There's still a lot of red, still seeing a lot of red. Of, this is how it used to be, how are we going forward, and we don't have that tap in of saying, who else is doing this, because obviously we're trying to premier it forward. Uh, along with that, uh, that statement is that we're going from, we're dividing even further down from an EMS and a CMS to an MXS in a month. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that we're doing that's just <coughs> on the plate of, let's ask the questions so we can get some valid answers, write these lessons, learn, send it to <coughs> that ACC know what we're doing, Develop. So there's a lot of moving pieces right now that we just don't have the answers to, and we're trying to develop them so we can say, okay, yay, nay, and what's the next step? So I'm learning more about this brief as, as it continues to go down the structure so I can take some things back and ask the chief uh, where we set the process. So uh, there's going to be a lot more questions than answers right now. That's how it is. You guys, you guys should be more on the admin side, more on the actual operational side, where it's affecting maintenance operations. So uh, it's just they're strictly like add on besides what I believe is so. There's a lot of things I like to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the main right? Uh, giving back to fire squadron commanders who have their 
uh, internal um, forms that they're going through, uh, discussing things with uh, young majors, lieutenant colonels, trying to give them that autonomy back to say, hey, this is what I want to do and get those, but those are cramped, right? You still got them to size some things out and say, here's what we need to get done. These are the things that we're looking to uh, try and emphasize and then take it back up right so now. Our squadron commanders, they love it. They go right up to the boss the door and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. And they say, okay, we're the concert, as opposed to the group and then their wedge and then the staff and their wedge and something staggered for a little bit and then if the commander doesn't know anything about it, it's a direct line and he's uh, he's on the uh, verge of autonomy. He says, go do it and let's see what you come up with. So it's, it's very, it's very nice. What's the command of that? Second. 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 Fire squad commanders. <coughs> lieutenant colonels. Yeah. Young yeah. lieutenant colonels. Yeah. Fire squad. I think it's, it's, the size, just, right? it's the same as what they are right now. So, you know, it's based upon the inventory we have. There is a goal. Uh, I don't know if goal is the right word. There's been discussion about why don't we just have all of our squadron commanders as lieutenant colonels. Some of it is inventory. You know, some of it is if the lieutenant colonels are in the staff and the majors are squadron commanders, maybe we should do that differently and have the majors on our staff, some lieutenant colonels out there. Uh, so there's been discussion, but nothing's changed from what it is currently. We still have majors that are doing squadron command for in a fighter squadron that's going to be a lieutenant colonel. So as you can see here, here's what the basic fighter squadron structure looks like. Uh, you got a deputy for ops and a deputy for maintenance. One squadron superintendent, I think they're maintenance guys right now. Is that right? right? Can we get a fighter squadron so the superintendents are maintainers? Yes. Is that right? Chief of the is going to be like Colonel Diaz, uh, just for maintenance officers, major captain. Yes. So yes. Our, both squadrons right now have lieutenant uh, colonel DOs and uh, major boats for the DN. As we, as we go into the medical side of this, I think I think the, the graph on the left, uh, I think that's pretty telling. I think we've all experienced this. If you haven't, your family members have. Or maybe if you know some retired folks that are trying to get care on, on an installation. A little bit, a little bit difficult, right? And then uh, as we have airmen that are, if you're not, if you're not on a, if you're not a flyer, you're not in flight medicine. The, the direct care with our airmen is. is sketchy at best, right? And we lose airmen all the time in the system. There's something wrong with them, they're not a full up round, and, and the chain command doesn't know about it for months, years, however long. Uh, they just kind of bounce around the system and they never get fixed. So uh, this, this is one of the ways in which they're gonna try to get after that. And I think you'll see that they're having some, some fairly good success with that. Yep. Non-flyer care is random. Okay, so now what they've got is they've got a uh, they split between beneficiary and then they, they've got active duty. So basically every active duty member there kind of gets flight medicine-like care, right? They're being tracked and managed. There's some uh, a lot of um, communication between the providers and, and the chain of command. And they're able to uh, kind of proactively work all those airmen that are in the down staff to get them back up again. Here you go, 45 airmen in the Air Forces squadron were down, 32 were returned, 5 boarded, and then 7 case managed. <clears throat> so some of the quotes there, 70 EMS airmen, 51 of them returned. Okay, so this, this is a good thing, I think. Um, and from what I understand, again, curtain from off the folks that are there, the, the beneficiary community is now being seen mostly downtown, and the, the community, they like that. Right, is that, is that the sense you get? There's nobody know. Depends on the well, right, sure. I, th I think in this case, I think it's working pretty well for them. Good stuff. Anybody have any questions or comments on that? So, Chief, under this model, who did the med group squadron SG actually report to? Are they reporting to the new commander or are they reporting to the AHA? Whose asset are they at this point in this? I think for the next couple of months, they're still the wing commanders, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, we have a transition. Not home is it one of those transition. The, the goal, the end goal, right, is that this, we're wanting to do this across our Air Force, and we've got some information, and I think it was a letter or something uh, that was signed by SECAF 
on that operational medical piece and being able to split. So we're one of the services that all of our all of our medical capabilities have been in this one fashion and not tied to mission, whereas other ones have a, a piece that's tied to mission and can get after readiness. And the original plan was all of this was going to go to DHA. And then we were struggling with how are we going to maintain the readiness of our force if we give them control over all this medical piece. And this is how we're going to do it. Mountain Home jumped out on this well before the DHA piece. They knew that that was coming down the road. We said, hey, we're going to have two lines of effort here. One's going to be beneficiary based. That should be what the DHA has the input into. And one should be operational readiness focused. And that's where the Air Force will still maintain control over that. Current structure is that SP is part of the wing staff and reports to the wing command. Just like in the future, right, mentors are still going to report to a wing with regard to being on the wing and being an Air Force member. Their, their day to day uh, guidance and, and things like that on how to operate within a medical center, that's going to be from DHA. But how to be in the, an airman in the Air Force and how to be a member of that wing is still going to be the direction from that wing command. That's not what we're getting down in the field, Chief. Really? That is not what we're getting briefed in the medical field at all. We're getting briefed that basically we are a tenant unit at that wing. My 06 will report to the DHA civilian who's got that region. Tom. Yeah. I'll, sure. I'll chat with my SG and make sure I'm not speaking out of turn, but everything I've been talking through is it. So we're being briefed differently at Langley. Yeah. So basically they're saying that there's going to be two lines. Basically, you're going to have your rebel commander, your commander, which is going to be the readiness of focus, and then you're going to have your DHA director, all within the same facility, and the DHA director is going to be the beneficiary aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, our director is not going to be but that's what I'm tracking, is the fact that there's going to be a piece that DHA has oversight over, but there's going to be a piece that the Air Force has oversight over. <coughs> I'll talk with our SG to ensure that we're getting the right messages out to the field so you all are hearing the same things and not hearing different things. At least inside our own command, you should be hearing the same thing, right? So I'll follow up with one of those. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Chief, is, um, are the deputies swapping in and out? So, like, how are they doing the CRPs? I'm not tired of that as a former first sergeant. I'll just kind of curious how they work in that. So, we can, and then, who's there? Fellow authorities. You know, a lot of times stuff shifted up to our group. Is that just going straight to those deputies as well? And then when you say, Robust CSS, what is that? Like how big is, how much did they plus up the CSS? Well, the robust, we've got a plan across our, my boss gets briefed monthly on revitalizing the squatters with regard to CSS as employee management. So when you're talking a robust CSS, you're talking at the wing level robust CSS? Well, like the slide said that they, they went to like a robust CSS. Yeah. I think robust means that it's actually filled, the positions that you have on your CSS are filled. As far as the appellate authorities, I don't know all those answers. I do know that it goes, there's a middleman, the DCO and the DCS can, can be that appellate authority piece and not everything's being answered by the wing. Because if he was the appellate, then there's another level that the NAP now has to play at. So right now, if, if, right now, if the A1 wanted to work something with it within the Mountain Home or within Seymour Johnson or within Holloman or within whatever, right? Who are they going to contact? They're going to contact your FSS commander, right? And then your FSS commander is going to start working at Tasker on behalf of ACC to answer some kind of a thing that you just give them, right? Whereas now you've got an A1. So guess what the FSS commander doesn't have to worry about? FSS commander's not, that's an admin type of thing, right? The FSS commander's gonna worry about the customer service that they provide for the base and the services that they're been tasked to do, right? And it's the same with all those communities. The A4, we would have reached into your maintenance group or we would have touched your maintenance group. No, we have an A4 now. So they're gonna work those types of things, you know what I mean, as far as a broad oversight. Uh, uh, maintaining uh, statistics, maintaining the different uh, uh, reporting tools, that's an A staff type of responsibility. Give me. Yeah, Chief, I think we have a question about this. I'm listening to what the question he asked. Sorry, I'm Chief Carcamo from the FSS at Seymour. And I look at robust CSS, of course my antenna goes up. 
<laughs> and at Seymour, you know, I was directed, fill all the CSSs as much as you can. Pull them out of high, you fill, you fill, you fill. The issue I have is when I have um, other fellow chiefs calling me saying, hey, I want my body, I don't have a body. And I know you are a large maintenance unit, for instance, and you're three, four hundred deep. I can't send you what I have, which I can't throw a dead cat in UPS without giving you a three level. So if I send you three, other, three level out of tech school to a 300 person squadron, really that's not useful to you at all. Because you're going to call me and you're going to tell me this person can't do X, Y, Z, because they haven't been around long enough. And I need time to grow them. Any talk of in the Avon community growing that pipeline or doing something differently because I don't have stats and techs. I'm hurting in that area, just like I'm sure most of you. I can't send you, I'd rather send you a seasoned staff or tech that can help you versus a three, a three level somebody at tech school. And I'm being told, I get this, send me anybody. No, I can send you anybody, but I guarantee I don't do returns after 30 days. <laughs> don't call me and say this person's not working out for me because I don't have the body to give you, so I'd rather be a little more strategic and see Well, the first thing we had to do, right, so Chief Malik and, and Colonel Ross have been knocking this down, and mm -hmm. Sam Tavlar, and, uh, so yes, there's things that have gone on in your UNTW to get after the training pipeline and ensure that those personnel are being trained on things they need. Some of those skill sets in the CSS stop being trained to people in their pipeline because we went away from CSSs and they're starting to build those. I don't have the ins and outs particulars, but yes, I know that they are focused on that. The other thing that we found when we first went into this CSS optimization and looking at that was that we had experienced personnel that were being misutilized, right? Mm -hmm. That were being in other areas that we could have put them in somewhere in these group staffs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't need those, right? Now we can put those personnel down into those squatter CSSs. Some of those are civilian bills, right? Yes, sir. Billets that we needed to work on the funding and work on the timing to get those things filled. Uh, with our civilian hire thing. So all of it is all in one. And I agree with you that, you know, the unit that's one deep doesn't need a three level in there, right? It's a challenge when they get a three level in there. But then again, you end up becoming like a 20th fighter wing and just keep feeding coons on because every three level you get that you train, as soon as they're trained, guess what? I'm taking them out of the CSS. So you get to start all over again and start training again. You know what I mean? It's going to be one of these type of turns uh, until we get our manning right across that entire career field uh, as we stood up the CSS. But some of it, 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 especially in the fighter squadron, some of that was immediately done about two and a half to three years ago when we hired civilians to come in and, and do that for scheduling and doing the UDM duties and doing some of the other program management duties for the fighter squadrons. We're starting to see a little bit more of those positions across in the other piece. I don't know if that, that helps, but we're looking at it, and I know your career field is looking at it too, as far as to ensure that we have. Uh, I, I, we're not growing our Air Force like we had to grow our Air Force 4,000 maintainers. But we are looking at those, and they manage that pipeline to ensure that we can meet the needs. I'm sorry to ask you. Just one more question. Um, not related to anything I don't think we've talked about, but in regards to the structure. What's for now? An EPR. So, and, and this is for, for you gentlemen or some of the folks that are there. How are we identifying a, a deputy evaluator level on EPRs when there isn't that? So this is... So we can just jump on that grenade boss. <laughs> so your Air Force Senior Leadership Council about two and a half years ago, year and a half ago, two years ago, two years ago at least, made the determination that we need to remove deputy evaluator from the form. Since that time frame, we have discussed it multiple times and we have not gotten anything in action to get it off. We thought it was gonna happen in the fall of last year when we just changed the other things with the EPRs, didn't happen. I brought it up at a January app sale. It got tabled because we ran out of time. And I let everybody in the room know that hey, there's a deadline here. Like I said about deadlines to get in action. What's the deadline in my mind? 31 July. 31 July is the next time we do EPRs on senior NCOs that will require senior rate endorsement. So you go to 31 July, you had better back that up to about probably 31 May to be able to have the form ready to be able, where are we at? It's March. So we had a discussion yesterday in there again, and everybody raised their hand again and said, we need to move out on this. So I talked to Chief Nielsen, who's working in SAP MR. I said, you need a bullet background paperwork. Because the paper, because Chief Wright said, I, you know I me, mean? and I'm ready to be the action officer on this. I've got a few months left that I can focus my effort on trying to get this thing across the line. And so we're going to move out on it. We should be so not concerned about that question that you just asked me. But we are. Why should we be so not concerned about that question? 
There is a charge that is read to the board, every promotion board. Do you know what it says? Any rating level other than senior rater endorsement should not be considered positively or negatively in this consideration. Paraphrase. It says right there, unless it says senior rater endorsed, if it says intermediate, if it says deputy evaluator, positively or negatively, that rating, that in level of endorsement should not be considered as any measure of merit for that person's record. And yet, us, we can't get out of our own damn way. So they go in there and they read that board charge. All the chiefs sit there and shake their head accordingly, and then they see deputy evaluator and they start, ooh, man, that's awesome. Look at that deputy evaluator. No, it's not. You want to know why it's not? Because it's arbitrary. So those were the two COAs that I presented the app self. One was COA 1, senior rater and other, right? You're either senior rater endorsed or you're other, and then other is good. It's just like a promote, right? You're going to get considered for promotion opportunities. The other COA, there's rigor in senior rater endorsement, right? There's percentages. There's a level of scrutiny on it. We're actually opening that up now to where the senior rater can use an EFDP style where he can bring their group commanders in and they can rack and stack and then they can MLR style score their records and determine who's going to be senior rater in that wing, which gives transparency because now there's a process just like uh, we do with our force distribution. That can happen. Rigor. Deputy evaluator, no rigor. So COA 2 is keep deputy evaluator, but then let's talk about percentages. How many people in a wing can get deputy evaluator? What's the rigor behind it? Forced, uh, you have to have a force endorsement because there's people that are going to get signed because we don't have that at deputy evaluator. So the consensus was, and that's a lot of freaking work and guidance to do something that we're being charged to not consider. So that's where, I'm sorry, I get, but it just bugs the crap out of me, this stuff. Because so my, my, my concern was always you all, right? Was your promotion opportunities. It pisses me off that somebody would do that because if you're a master sergeant and you're the 20th fighter wing civil engineer squadron, you're an HVAC master sergeant. You're working out in the 819th Red Horse squadron at Moundstrom. And guess what? You're a master sergeant HVAC in their squadron, right? They determined your EPR is going to close at the squadron level. Based upon performance, you only get so many that you can push up. You're doing great work for us, but you know what? You're going to get signed by the, by the squadron commander. Guess what? Intermediate. You, your performance is just as good as her performance. You're not the top performer. We already pushed up for senior rater endorsed. You're going to close at the squadron level. Deputy evaluator, because his boss is a colonel who works for the Ninth Air Force. So now all of a sudden, if a board <coughs> arbitrarily thinks that deputy evaluator means something, they just hurt you in a promotion, and that you are equal going into the promotion. So, uh, so right now, the deputy evaluator will still be the DCOMs, to answer your question. <laughs> we'll still be the DCOMs, right? And those squadron commanders will send forward the records, just like it says in the in the document in our AFI right now, that hey, they make, the squadron commander makes the determination that I think this should be endorsed by somebody other than me. They send it up to the deputy commanders, and they make a decision whether they want to sign that EPR, or it goes to the senior rater. So that process is the deputy commanders, but I'm hopeful, slightly, that we'll get this across the line for you all this year and get rid of the amb ambiguity that is in the right now. Sorry, John. No, no, that was fun, thank you. <laughs> so we have six minutes to lunch, so. As soon as you asked, I watched Frank start drinking. <laughs> You've heard me talk about it enough. <laughs> all right, hey, so, so uh, back, back to the Mountain Home Experiment, uh, what they're doing, obviously they're constantly evaluating the pros and cons of this construct. Uh, they're obviously communicating with ACC and, and COMAC on a, on a monthly basis. I think they send a report to COMAC right yeah. on a monthly yeah. basis. Uh, working with A1, uh, Frank briefly touched on it earlier. Some, some of the challenges they're, they're having, though, is having the authorities, having the wing commander have the authorities to make changes in a timely fashion that, that the staff sees they need to make, right, without doing an ACR and OCR get something pushed through to make some organizational structure changes. So I think they finally solved that riddle a couple months ago, but that was something they were struggling with. Uh, Intel and uh, wing weapons into the A3. Weapons attack. Weapons attack, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, creating an acquisition squadron, and I think I've got a slide on that if we do have time. Uh, obviously, the AEW construct, they briefed the, uh, 
Mr. McNeil touched on it earlier, months becoming its own squadron, and EMS and CMS combining into a major squadron. <coughs> and then, uh, they're looking at adding deputy commanders to the fighter squadrons, not the ops and maintenance. So there's your acquisition squadron. This is what they're looking to do. I think this just got approved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so this, yeah. is your, this is your organization, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Help your write that requirements package. Also have 2A involved as well. So they have like that one, um, one section of focus on those. <coughs> but yeah, so we have a lot of service contracts. But that's the efficiency that's going to be great. Are you happy about it? Yeah. Go bring it up. I know, I know uh, uh, Colonel Hummel, which we have been, this is something that he's been, he's been working in the for probably the last six or eight months, and then finally got What's that? What's that called? Yeah. It has a little bit of resemblance to what we have in our AMIC, our Acquisition Management Integration, Integration Center. Center at ACC that manages many of the large contracts across our command. We have functional people within there to, to help with those contract lets and the work of the process. So we're probably going to run out of time to get on the two deep into what's the next one after the A one. This is just the A staff and how the A staff is is uh is set up. I don't know if you had anything to pull no, out. Yeah, just obviously go through all the manpower issues by the A staff. I think Frank touched on it earlier, but the good thing is it's having. Uh, that staff function in between the squadrons and the group, or between the groups, uh, and the ACC staff, uh, really all the birds, they can function their focus on the mission. So when we come back from lunch, I had that part for revitalizing squadrons. We can follow on some discussion on this here, but what I'll tell you is there's no hard and fast what we intend to get out of this. We don't expect all of our fighter squadrons and maintenance to integrate the same way into one squadron across ACC. Is there value in it? Yeah, I think there's some value in it. Is there some growing pains in it? Of course there's some growing pains in it. I remember back in 2007 when we were gonna put maintenance back into ops, right? And I had a very adamant opinion about it at that time because I was a maintenance guy that was gonna be left in this material maintenance group as a back shop guy. I was like, what the hell is this? And, you know what I mean? And this isn't going to work. You need a maintenance guy that focuses on maintenance. You can't have an ops guy and blah, 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 blah. What's my next job? I told you, I'm the ops group job. And they're like, Man, why don't we have maintenance in here? Because who am I developing? Like part of my development is this 06 is sitting next to me. And his next job is going to be a, a wing commander and having it maintenance inside of it, an operation. And oh, by the way, that maintenance squadron superintendent, not the same as I got as an ops group. Uh, superintendent. So there's a lot of benefits to that. There's a lot of benefits to a lot of ways that we've aligned this one. The MUNS isn't just ammo going to be ammo. It's also taking armament and the weapons piece of it and becoming a MUNS squadron and just trying to find synergy. That was trying to get after. The reason we did this pieces of it was to get after squadron size. We had squadrons that were 800, 1100 people big. If we break them off into 250 to 300, it's more manageable. You can look at any kind of an organization is more manageable. You know your people, they know their mission and everything like that. So that was why we broke some of those squatters. It wasn't because we said, ah, man, we got to put maintenance with officer. Hey, Munns needs their own squatter. It was to get after the size of the organizations to be more efficient and to get after revenues. We'll take a, a break now for lunch. They said it'll be